Good afternoon. It is 1.03 p.m. and uh, <clears throat> it is time to call to order the regular meeting of the Rancho Mirage City Council on this date, April 1, 2021. And <clears throat> the City Council, the Library Board, Let me start that over. It's, uh, I heard some noise and it kind of threw me off. Good afternoon. It is a little past 1 p.m., April 1, 2021. I hereby call to order the regular meeting of the Rancho Mirage City Council, the Library and Observatory Board, the Housing Authority Board, the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. Isaiah, would you lead us in the flag salute? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to have Kofi Antebaum, our Director of Administrative Services, lead, lead us today. Thank you. Ready to see. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Christy, would you take roll call, please? Certainly. Councilmember Kite? Present. Councilmember Smotrich? Here. Councilmember Townsend? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Here. And Mayor Hobart? Here. Now we move to uh, non agenda public comments. Isaiah, would you take that over, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we will now open up our non agenda public comment period. Uh, this is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak on issues that are not on today's agenda for a maximum of three minutes. If you are participating remotely, you can indicate that you would like to make a non-agenda public comment now by hitting the raise hand button on Zoom or hitting star nine on your telephone. Before we go to our remote audience, uh, is there anyone, do we have cards? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, is there anyone here in person that did not fill out a non-agenda public comment card and would like to make one? Okay, seeing no one in person that wants to make a non-agenda public comment, we will move to our remote audience. And the first speaker is Michael Schneider. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I was listening to the last meeting and I heard Mrs. Smotrich um, encourage everybody to apply to your commissions and talk about your commissions. And I just wanted to reiterate how uh, honored and excited I would be to join your traffic commission. My application is, uh, I believe, in your system. And I know that you make appointments soon. And I was inspired by Mrs. Smotrich and hope that you would approve me. I uh, have a home in Sunrise Country Club. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker. Speaker is Brad Anderson. Hi, yes, Brad Anderson. This is fast. I thought I was be on hold for a while. Uh, I live in the city of Ransom Ross on Ferber Drive. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize uh, how important it is for people to adopt pets today. And, uh, and uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, I, I actually lost one of my dogs on Sunday morning. And uh, <sighs> And it's always hard when you have a dog that passes away. But uh, his claim to fame was that earlier this month uh, there was an automobile, automotive uh, accident out on Highway 111 in North Palm Springs, and the dog was missing for five days. So, uh, so uh, my dog and me we decided to go take a look, and we did. And Rusty, because of his uh, keen keen skills, uh, we located that dog. Uh, no claim to fame, you know, nothing like that, but. Uh, Things like that, that people, if they get involved, they make a difference in people's lives. And, uh, and I'm getting not choked up, but uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, if you have room in your family for a dog, get a dog, because uh, you, uh, you won't regret it. So, uh, But anyway, I wanted to go off of that and, and talk about the city and uh, this, the state of emergency. Again, this cancer came on fast, within a week he was gone. And the reason I'm singing this is because 
if we didn't have this state of artificial state of emergency, I would have had him in earlier. I know I would. I would have had him checked out uh, just routinely, and which I do, and, and that wasn't done, and it's because of this. I can't fairly blame these guys because I can. I can make the arrangements to do that. But again, this, this artificial in state of emergency that we have for businesses to collect money are putting in un, undue burden on everybody, and I would like to see that lifted. And uh, there was other talk at the other meetings, considered political aspirations of other people, and 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 the rant and the raving of certain council members. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of sealed your own fate. But I would like to hopefully have the city council consider not running for the next election. Uh, uh, and that's all I have for this. Thank you. Thank so you. one second uh, before we go to the next person. I just thought I would mention uh, Brad Anderson. Uh, you lost your dog this past week. I lost uh, one of mine, my wife and I. I know the uh, pain you're suffering. Okay, the, the next speaker will be... Sean Abramowitz. Yes, uh, good afternoon, City Council. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm still uh, recovering from being a little sick. Uh, Mayor, I'm sorry to hear about your dog passing. Thank you. Um, my name is Sean Abramowitz, and I am a new resident to Ranch Mirage. My wife and I moved to Tuscany last year in August. And my recommendation for anyone looking at moving to Ranch Mirage is to not move during August. It's extremely hot. Needless to say, I am now a resident, and I'm proud of the city's response to COVID during this difficult time for all of our residents. What I'm not proud of is the response to comments from certain citizens asking for change. I understand that you may not agree with Ranch Mirage Ford's request, nor anyone else's request for changing the city council meeting time to 5 p.m., as well as when we hold the election locally. I mean, after all, we've had these times for years, but I do ask this question. If the city council meeting and election dates were moved based off their residents' request over 20 years ago, wouldn't it be mindful of you to once again pull your citizens? What is the harm in actually looking at the feasibility of such change? I understand that change is hard and uncomfortable, but as local leaders, that is literally your job, to look at changing and improving things for the betterment of the community. Now, the key word here is community, because without one, there wouldn't be a council nor a government. I ask that you take seriously this request from hundreds of your citizens into moving the city council meeting times to an appropriate time for all working class citizens to attend, as well as aligning our local elections up with the state and federal elections. As a new citizen of Ranch Mirage, one that is younger than the average median age and one that cares about his community, my request and the request of others is not unreasonable. Do the right thing and research out what is being asked of you. Thank you so much for your time. I unfortunately do have to go back to work. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, that was the last speaker. Seeing no one else that has indicated that they'd like to make a non agenda public comment, we'll go ahead and close that portion of the meeting. And I will return this back to you, Mr. Mayor, for council member comments. Who would like to go first? I will, Dana. Okay, Richard. It's uh, good afternoon to the to the council and to you, Mayor. And a brief comment on, from the individual that opened the meeting, talking about the various volunteers. I wanted to bring to our residents a way that they can volunteer for the city. The city of Rancho Mirage is seeking volunteers to serve on the city boards and commissions for a one-year term beginning June 1, 2020, 2021. It's a great way to get involved and assist with the future activities and growth of Rancho Mirage. Some of the opportunities that are offered are Architectural Review Board, Community Cultural Commission, Community Emergency Preparedness Commission, Community Parks and Trails Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, Housing Commission, Library and Observatory Advisory Commission, Mobile Home Fair Practices Commission, Planning Commission, Speaker Series Commission, 
and Traffic Safety Commission. If you can't find something out of that list, you're not looking very hard because there's a great deal of opportunities on all of those commissions. The city of Rancho Mirage is also seeking a volunteer to serve as a city representative on the Palm Springs International Airport Commission for a three-year term beginning July 1. The deadline for applying for all of these positions is next Monday at 5 p.m., that's April 5th, 2021. Applications received after the deadline may not be considered. Please visit the city's website at ranchamiragesa.gov to obtain an application form. This is a great opportunity. All volunteer positions are a great asset to our city. And I thank you for participating in the past if you've already done that. That's all I've got, Dana. Thank you, Richard. Who else? I'll be happy to go, uh, Mayor. Yeah, go, you're at the floor. Uh, and by the way, again, my uh, condolences regarding the doggy. Uh, I've lost dogs and it's immensely painful. So my sympathies. Uh, I'd like to address shredding day. Uh, to protect your identity and, and your environment by participating in the city's free document shredding and e-waste collection event. This event will be held on Saturday, April 10, and available to all Rancho Mirage residents with proof of residency. This free event will take place at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory in the West parking lot from 8 a.m. to noon, or when the trucks are full, whichever occurs first. All documents will be shredded on site and then recycled. Examples of documents one might shred include tax documents, bank statements, real estate transactions, and other legal or confidential papers that one does not want to put in the regular recycle bin. Shredding will be limited to six 12 inch by 17 inch by nine inch boxes of documents per resident. E-waste such as old televisions, computers, computers, monitors, cell phones, printers, and household electronics will also be collected free of charge and recycled. Residents may also drop off batteries for household devices such as laptops, flashlights, handheld radios, and other small household electronics. Household hazardous waste such as paint, pesticides, automobile batteries, light bulbs will not, I emphasize, will not be accepted at this event. If you have these types of items, please call Vertec at 760-340-2113 to schedule collection. For more information on the coming SHRED event, contact City Hall at 760-324-4511. We hope to see you there. And I have one other point that I'd like to make, if I may, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, being a member of Mission Hills Country Club for almost 28 years. I always look forward to one of our signature events, the ANA Inspiration. Uh, I had the pleasure of playing in the Pro-Am yesterday, as I have done for many years. I want to congratulate ANA, Mission Hills Country Club, the LPGA, the top female golfers from around the world, IMG, the Golf Channel, and all the sponsors, volunteers on 50 years here in Rancho Mirage. This is the second longest professional tournament 
in our country, second only to the masters. It's incre incredible to think that our wonderful fairways, blue skies and mountain vistas are broadcast to over 500 million homes in over 180 countries this time of the year. We truly do live in paradise, and I say that literally every day. Today is the official start of the event, and I hope you tune in to the Golf Channel to see who will be making the leap into Poppy's Pond. If you would, Jason, please roll the ANA video. The stage, a green oasis. The players, the best lady golfers in the galleries. The audience, America's television viewer. This one stands out almost above the rest of the movie's done. Oh, just pure. You're going in. <laughs> Five in a row for Annika Sorenstam. What a way to close it out. into the hole. It is a place that has a home and it is something then that you yearn to see year after year after year. Thank you, Mayor. It's a great event. Unfortunately, uh, we can't accommodate uh, spectators this year, but you can enjoy it uh, watching it on television. Uh, it certainly shows off the wonderful city we have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ted. Any other uh, comments by council members? Nothing for me. Yeah, nothing for me, Dana, this time. Okay, Thank great. You. In that case, we'll move on to uh, City manager comments. Yeah, uh, I have one comment today, uh, Mr. Mayor. A little bit of a sad day here in uh, Rancher Mirage. Uh, we are losing our director of public works, uh, Jesse Eckenroth. Um, him and his family are, are moving out of state and it is definitely our loss. Uh, Jesse has been a tremendous asset uh, to our city. Uh, for the last six years that he has worked here. Uh, he has impacted many in our community. Uh, sometimes they don't even know it. Um, being in charge of public works is a uh, very difficult job. Uh, their primary role is to keep our city beautiful and our streets driving nice and uh, our public facilities like our parks in top notch shape. Uh, we often get uh, compliments uh, from visitors and residents alike of uh, the look of our city, and that's because of the great works uh, at our public works department. And uh, Jesse, I just wanted to thank you for all your dedication and the long hours uh, and the enthusiasm that you brought to your work in keeping uh, Ranch Mirage a beautiful place to live. So thank you for your service to the city, and we will definitely miss you. I, uh... I thought we had a rule that it, you couldn't, that staff couldn't leave without a majority vote of the council. <laughs> Trust me, we, uh, we tried to uh, keep them by uh, doing a few tricks, but uh, we were unsuccessful. <laughs> That's our, lo our loss. We're going to miss you, Jesse. Jesse, you did a great job. I know you'll do well in the future. <laughs> Jesse, I'm, I'm angry at you for leaving. I consider you a good friend, uh, and we've had a chance to chat a little bit and uh, wish you and your family the absolute best. And uh, wherever you're going, you're going to be a great asset to that city. Thanks again, Jess. 
We have Jesse, Charlie. You've always been there with nice, calm, quick answers all the time. But I, I'm guaranteeing you one thing, you're gonna miss me asking you about that bridge. So just think about it. Good luck to you and your family, all the best. Jesse, I would also add my uh, words of praise because as Isaiah said, um, you have impacted our city and our residents more than mo most people would ever think about. Uh, you've played an important part in all your presentations and your decision making. Your presentations have been beautiful and you have indeed been a good friend to us all. We're going to miss you. We wish you all the best and just know we'll be thinking of you. Take care and uh, safe travels. Thank you. And uh, with sincerity, I, I will say it has been my pleasure and my honor to serve the city. So thank you. Are you seeing me for the reason? Uh, no, that was uh, my only comment for today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. <clears throat> we'll move to the minutes. Can we have a motion, uh, please, to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll Pardon. second that. Moved and seconded. Uh, can we uh, go to uh, our esteemed clerk and take a roll call? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Uh, We'll now move to the consent calendar. Isaiah, would you lead us through this, please? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, members Excuse of the- me. Excuse yes. me, before you go on, I just wanted to make note that I will be recusing myself, I believe from item uh, number six on that vote because of the tower market and gas station and its location close to my home. Thank you. Um, when you say that vote, which vote are you referring to? Item six. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Christy will note that for the record. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, you have nine items on your consent calendar for consideration. Uh, item number one is to waive the full reading of all ordinances introduced or adopted pursuant to this agenda. Item number two is extension of subdivision improvement agreement completion date for track map number 35089. Item number three is final acceptance of CP 13-308, traffic signal interconnect. Item number four is final acceptance of CP 19-35, Annenberg room modifications. Item number five is acceptance of CP 20-364, 70105, Frank Sinatra Drive property demolition. Item number six is the final acceptance of improvements for parcel map number 37486, Tower Market. Item number seven is the approval of the final track map number 36809, Del Webb. Item number eight, our contracts, and item number nine, our demands. Uh, before we go to the council, uh, if any member of the public would like to speak on one of these nine items, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Before we go to our remote audience, uh, Christy, do we have any speaker cards? No, we do not. Is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on one of these nine items? Okay, seeing no one here in person and seeing no one on our remote audience that wishes to speak on the consent calendar, we'll close the public comment period and I will turn this over to the council, Mr. Mayor. Hold on one second. <clears throat> Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, does anybody have any questions or motions in connection with any of those nine items? I'll move oh, to accept I, the consent calendar. I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, we've, we've had two people raise their hand uh, so before the council takes action, I'd like to call on those two speakers. First is Patty Shanker. Good afternoon. I think this is the right time to speak about one of the agenda items, correct? 
uh, items one through nine on the consent calendar. Yes, I think that item number, number six is what I'm referring to. I'm urging you to pass this ordinance to ban, uh, to amend your weapons ordinance to disallow the coot shoots and Rancho Mirage. So you're, you, you're, you're a little early, Patty. Can we get oh, you? Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, that, that's okay. Um, item number 12. Uh, so oh, when okay. we get to agenda uh, item number 12, it's that one. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Next is Andy and Amelia Carpenter. Yes, hi. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that um, that it was uh, not the right time to talk about the Porcupine Creek. So, so that's uh, item number 11. So when we get to that okay. item, do the same thing you just did. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any more raised hands, so sorry for the interruption, Mr. Mayor. No problem. Why don't we find out if anybody at home has an interest in speaking on any of these nine items? If there are no other comments, Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, uh, Christy, can you take the uh, roll call vote, please? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes, on every item except number six, on which I will be recusing myself. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. So motion carries 5 0 on all items except for six, which motion carries 4 0 with Council Member Smotrich recused. We will move forward then to item number 10. Is that correct, uh, Mr. City Manager? Yeah, this will be a, uh, a public works update by uh, Jesse Eckenroth. Jesse, go ahead. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right, I just wanted to give a uh, shout out to the Streets Department, Engineering Department, Facilities Department. The updates I'm going to give are a result of uh, the team um, none of the projects that I'm going to report on or anything I've really done, it's just been the team, whether it's our city engineer, Leland Cole, uh, Charlie Nesbitt, our project manager, Calvera Paschel, Chet Can, Justin Ruberg, all the guys who are out there day to day making this happen. So thank you guys. Uh, you make these presentations possible. So Jason, if you would pull up the PowerPoint, please. All right. So as you know, from time to time, I like to give updates. So I'm just going to give you kind of an update on uh, what's recently been completed, what's underway, uh, and then what is coming up in the future. So we've recently completed a project. You just accepted it for the library Annenberg room. Uh, as you can see in the slide, this is between the hallway and the Annenberg room. There's a door. Um, but we've made a closet for the door so the door can fold back into that closet when it's not in use. Uh, which is nice so that when we have events that are in the Annenberg room, this is a sound attenuating uh, door. So it can be put up for special events and it keeps the sound in the room. Uh, and the door is stowed away when it's not in use. So uh, big thanks to Charlie Nesbitt who oversaw this project and all the help we got from Aaron and the library crew doing this project. Um, another project we've recently completed is traffic signal painting. Uh, we recently completed seven intersections and we did it in-house this year with our crew. So our street supervisor, Justin Ruberg, said, hey, if we do it in-house and we use our guys, we will have money in our budget to provide new equipment in our traffic control cabinets for some of the projects, some of the locations that weren't in our interconnect project. So he took it upon himself to do this in-house with our guys. They did an excellent job. And this is typically a project that cost us about $50,000, and they were able to do it in-house. So Justin, Matt Reynolds, all you guys, thank you very much. Uh, typically, another project we, we've just kind of wrapped up is we get a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of the questions we get in our department are re re repetitive on, can I have a stop sign on my street? Can I increase the speed limit? Why is the speed limit so high in my street? So we've developed these standard FAQs that are on our city website. So if you go to our homepage and you can just click on the link, the city FAQs, and we'll go through signal synchronization, how it works, stop sign regulations, speed limit regulations, um, so that'll be very helpful. And then for staff, we're able to give uh, consistent responses because we can just go to um, all these responses we prepared. So when, when a resident 
uh, comes and has a question, we can give a um, uniform answer every time just based off this FAQs. Uh, so talking about signal synchronization, that's another project, that big project that we just completed and accepted today. Um, just We're going to show a few pictures. Uh, this is a before and after. So if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a traffic uh, cabinet. Before we did the project, on the right-hand side is the new cabinet. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of this project is that we got new equipment. So we got probably... Uh, close to or over a million dollars worth of equipment in our cabinets, which is going to make it more reliable and it's obviously much smarter equipment. So uh, even the cabling and everything that's on the right side on the new picture is much cleaner than what we, what we had in the past. Here is a picture of the fiber optic lines getting strung along Highway 111. So you can see the, it looks like a big black hose that's behind the gentleman who's uh, feeding that fiber optic uh, cable line underground there. I think we have about five miles of this 144 strand fiber optic cable. The majority of it runs down Highway 111. So we got all new communication lines, uh, which will take us well into uh, uh, all the needs that we'll have coming up for the next probably 50 years. This is the traffic management center. So this project uh, provided a traffic management center. This is the center out at our yard. So you can see the big screens and the monitors where the traffic signal technicians can sit in their office and monitor live feeds and see signal operations from all 40 of our signals that are interconnected in this project. Here's a close-up of one of the screens. I think the most interesting screen is probably the top center screen, and you can see a bunch of green dots, and you can see some black dots. All those green dots are showing that the signal is operating correctly, and that's all the 40 signals that were in the project. And then if you look on the lower screens, you'll see a snapshot of an intersection. There's some green arrows, some red arrows. So those are real time which traffic phases are having red lights and green lights. So we're able to do a lot of assessment just from the office. Instead of having to drive out to the field, we can do it right from the office. Here is a shot of one of our cameras. I think this is Indian and Highway 111. So we can look at real time, uh, see what's going out on in the streets. Uh, so if we can see traffic starting to back up, we can look at maybe doing a coordination change. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that, that's the um, kind of wrapping up what that project brought us. What's coming up next? Um, since the project is complete, we're updating our timing uh, to the new California MUTCD traffic signal timings. And an example of, of what that's going to do is the, the intersection that's shown on your screen is Indian Trail and Highway 111. And the current cycle length for that is 100 seconds. But the new standards have updated crossing times for bicycles and pedestrians. Uh, so there's calculated times that it takes for pedestrians to walk across the street. And now you have to figure in bicycles, uh, how long it takes them to get across an intersection just like a vehicle would. So what's going to happen when we go through these adjustments is there's going to be some intersections that have longer cycle lengths. So this one in particular at Highway 111 Indian Trail is going to go from 100 seconds to 115 seconds. So cycle lengths are going to be longer, uh, which is going to benefit the drivers on 111. It's going to make side streets wait a little bit longer. The benefit of doing the project that we did is we got smarter controllers in our cabinets now, so they're able to adjust to um, cycle lengths that are longer and catch back up if they get out of cycle. Uh, which is going to uh, lessen the impacts of the new timing that's going to be out in the field. So that, that'll be coming in the near future. Uh, Wolfson Park expansion, we held a community workshop um, just yesterday, and the picture that's on the screen is the vacant lot that's just uh, adjacent to Wolfson Park. And then one of the concept plans that was shared with us yesterday is an expansion of Wolfson Park onto that vacant lot. Uh, so the idea is to make the expansion congruous with what's there, uh, to add parking spaces, sidewalks, and uh, a real clear connection with the Butler Abrams Trail, and then to obviously connect the sidewalk um, from the property uh, directly east and directly west of the vacant lot. So great meeting, great concept plans, and we're working towards wrapping up design, and we'll bring something back to council within a couple months on that project. Frank Sinatra Bridge, so an update on this, and this is for uh, Mr. Townsend, just because I knew you were wondering about the bridge. Uh, we we're working away on the bridge. We're at about the 95% complete with designs. Uh, the issue, I think, right now that not only our city is facing, but every city is the Highway Bridge Program or the HBP Program. 
uh, has multiple bridges in its program and each bridge coming in at around $50 million has a substantial cost impact. So recently what we were told is that uh, while our bridge is still in the program, uh, they are not going to identify a year when construction funds will be available for the project. So they've said you can build the project and when we get money, if we get money, we can pay you back. So that's a, you know, 40, 45 million dollar uh, hit to the city. So uh, that is kind of new information that's coming out and we're working with Caltrans um, to kind of figure out what the impacts are. But right now, uh, it's not just our city, but the entire highway bridge program due to the cost of bridges is just heavily oversubscribed. Um, so it's, it will have an impact on the construction of our bridge and we're still working through the details of that. But our design is pretty much wrapped up. We are also working on a local road safety plan. This was a grant um, that we submitted, we won, uh, and it's gonna identify priority areas in our city based on crash data, and then we'll have safety enhancements or safety countermeasures uh, uh, to, to mitigate those uh, priority areas and those uh, crash areas that we've identified as high, um, high collision areas. So that's underway right now, and that'll probably be wrapped up in about three months. And wanted to touch on the Rancher Mirage Fire Station 50. This is the fire station that's on Highway 111. We're going out, uh, we're going to put out a notice inviting bids. I think that's scheduled to go out in two weeks. And so I'm just going to talk about what we're going to do at our fire station. So here's a picture of the fire station. Uh, we're doing seismic improvements around the entire fire station. Uh, but while we're doing that, since we're going to be in there tearing walls apart, tearing roofs apart, we're taking advantage of uh, us being in there to do some other things to the fire station. So it's going to get an entirely new roof that's going to be put on the fire station. We're going to have a fitness center addition that's um, added to the fire station. We're adding ADA restroom, uh, ADA compliant restrooms inside the building and doing ADA site and parking lot improvements uh, while we're there with the project. So we're just incorporating uh, multiple things into that project, taking advantage of us being there. And then the Butler Abrams Trail, that went out to bid. We received bids and we should be awarding a contract to do some rehab on the Butler Abrams Trail. The picture on the left is the existing trail. Uh, the picture on the right is a different part of the trail and then it's overlaid with some of the plans, with the plans that we developed. So uh, we're gonna do some capacity enhancements there. We're gonna make the trail wider uh, we're going to put new fence posts in and we're going to allow access from the dirt path and the concrete and the asphalt path because um, right now there's a fence down the entire stretch so we're going to add some access points between them and then make the trail a little bit wider so uh, we're scheduled to do that and probably may have that project wrapped up and then tamaris neighborhood pavement just an update on the summer project that we have planned there's six cul-de-sacs that we plan to rehabilitate. So we'll pull the asphalt out and put new asphalt in those six cul-de-sacs. And then the rest of the area will get a slurry application. These six cul-de-sacs were in too bad a shape to take slurry, so they'll get new asphalt. But the whole Tamaris area and Frank Sinatra is slated uh, for slurry. And we'll be out doing the crack fill in this uh, neighborhood uh, within the next couple weeks. And then lastly, we have three grant submissions uh, that we are preparing right now. One is to close bike lane gaps. Uh, we've recently done a lot of new bike lanes around the city and some areas were constrained by the width of the roadway. So they're more expensive to put a bike lane in. Uh, the picture that's up there right now, the yellow line represents a, a bike lane gap and that's Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope. So we'd have to move the medians and scoot them over. Uh, to make those bike lanes work. So we're submitting a grant application to do that in several locations. And then we're also submitting a different grant application for pedestrian paths. One of the pedestrian paths we identified is in front of the Rancho Mirage Community Park and the amphitheater. Uh, so this just kind of shows the picture of where, we're, where we want con uh, continuous pedestrian paths. So all the way from, from the river to the library. And that'll go in front of the Rancho Mirage Community Park. So that will be one grant application. And then the last grant application we're pre preparing right now is for new ADA ramps. We did an ADA ramp project, I think two, two and a half years ago, where we did, I think, close to 50, 54 ramps. And we still have some on our list. So the last grant submission we'll be um, applying for is new ADA ramps along Bob Hope. That wraps up my presentation. 
Just wanted to give you an update on what's going on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yes, I have, I have, a, I have yeah. a, if I may. Hey, Teddy, you want to go first? Ted? Go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. I just wanted to say, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, you certainly are leaving with a wonderful, wonderful uh, programs that you have done and personally waved all the way through many, many months, many years of getting this done. Just another a feather in the cap of, of Rancho Mirage, including uh, bike trails and uh, safety measures and everything for the people to have a better lifestyle in Rancho Mirage. That's a great, great job. Ted, I'm sorry. Thanks, Charlie. Well, I think what it, what it reflects is how proactive uh, Rancho Mirage is. And again, it's an example of, uh, of us taking leadership in these areas, accepting the responsibility to do the work, the work ourselves, uh, not waiting for others. Uh, Jesse, you, you've taken really the, the bull by the horns on so many of these projects and have led the way. And it makes us very proud to be part of the city. Uh, anybody that watched that presentation just now and recognizes all that we're doing here in the city internally uh, with our staff has to be extremely impressed. Again, Jesse, thank you loads. And I'll also add my thanks, Jesse, and um, it just shows the talent that we've amassed in our city, uh, both at the leadership position and in the different uh, director positions, as well as the staff members who make suggestions and are wanting to do a number of projects in-house uh, to uh, certainly benefit our budget. But while you're talking about the bicycle path, Jesse, could you please just tell us how many miles you're going to be adding and are they going to be on the street and behind the curb? And what is our total number of bicycle miles uh, both on the curb, on the, behind the curb and on the street? I wasn't prepared for this one, but I think I'm going to get pretty close. Okay, for class, is good. class two bike lanes, I believe we have 41.5 miles, which includes a little section that's on Ramon that's actually in the county. And then for okay. sidewalks, I believe we have 39.5 miles. And the grant applications that we're submitting for are three separate locations. The additional um, bike lane mileage would be minimal. It would be on road, so a striped class two on road. And it's really just to close the gaps because whenever there's a gap in a bike lane, it, the bike rider has to get outside of the bike lane and into the vehicle travel lane. And then it just creates a more dangerous uh, condition than if they're continually in a bike lane. Uh, the bike riders are allowed to do that. There's, there's no uh, regulation against it. It's just safer if we can provide a continuous bike lane. These are expensive improvements to do because we're talking about road reconfiguration. So that's why we've condensed them together and put a grant application together for the three locations. Thank you, Jesse. And I know that safety is always our priority. So it's nice that we're going to be able to close those gaps, even though it is uh, an expensive uh, project. Uh, it'll be wonderful for all of our visitors and our residents. Thank you again. Jesse, you sure you want to leave before the bridge is done? That's your baby. Can we, can we coax you to stick around until it's done? <laughs> They put the funding for the bridge in beyond years, so I don't really know what that means. I told, I told my wife, Shannon, I said, I don't really want to leave before the bridge is done, but they stuck the funding in beyond years, and I said, I don't know if I want to be here in beyond years, so we've got to make the decision now. That's right. Maybe you can get the bridge built where you're going. I don't want to see a bridge ever again in my life, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think one day of closure on the road every year is just fine with me. Okay. Okay. 
This is just informational, uh, Mr. Mayor, so no actions necessary from the council. So yeah. <clears throat> if there's no more questions, we can move on. Okay, well then we'll move on to item number 10. And uh, we'll ask our city manager to introduce the uh, subject. Certainly. So uh, this is our public hearing portion of the meeting, and this is actually agenda item number 11. So any member of the public that is wishing to speak on the Porcupine Creek project, this is your item. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is the Porcupine Creek retreat, uh, and I will turn this over to Mina for the presentation. Mina. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and city council members. Today I will be presenting the Porcupine Creek retreat project. The project consists of environmental impact report case number EIR 20002, specific plan case number SB 20002, general plan zoning map amendment case number GPZMA 20002, development agreement case number DA 20001, and preliminary development plan case number PDP 20006. The property is located off of Dunes View Road. The closest major arterial is Highway 111. The property currently holds a main house, existing guest premises, and a golf course on site. The project proposes to create a specific plan to occupy approximately 191 acres of the 230 acre Porcupine Creek Estate. The specific plan will allow for the development of the existing Porcupine Creek property as an exclusive retreat with a total of up to 50 keys. Proposed upgrades would include up to 27 new keys and incorporate a modified main house, a new restaurant, dining deck, upgraded spa complex, additional retreat related facilities, and a rerouted 18-hole golf course. The environmental impact report process began in April 2020. The applicant filed an environmental impact report application, and the city, acting as the lead agency, began the EIR process. The timeline for the subject project is as follows. Following the application, the notice of preparation was prepared and distributed on July 27, 2020, to solicit guidance from agencies and the public on the scope and content of the EIR. The 30-day NOP period ended on August 25, 2020. On May 19, 2020, the city provided written notice to California Native American tribes. Each tribe was provided an opportunity to request consultation on issues such as, but not limited to, the type of CEQA document to be prepared, and the significance of tribal cultural resources. On October 30th, 2020, the city circulated a notice of availability of the draft EIR for review and comment by the public responsible and reviewing agencies. As required by CEQA, the comment period for the draft EIR ran for 45 days, concluding on December 14th, 2020. The majority of comments related to traffic and noise, both of which were studied and addressed in the draft EIR. A final EIR was then prepared and completed in compliance with CEQA guidelines. No significant and unavoidable impacts were identified in the final EIR, and mitigation measures were included in the mitigation and monitoring program. All comments received during the public review period for the draft EIR were included and responded to in the final EIR. And finally, a public hearing notice was prepared and distributed on March 17, 2021. As required by CEQA, environmental study topics were analyzed in the draft environmental impact report. As documented in the draft EIR, the project would result in less than significant environmental impacts with or without mitigation in all of the environmental study areas. Included in the list of analyzed topics are traffic, noise, and cultural resources, just to name a few. The purpose of the general plan zoning map amendment is to amend the existing general plan zoning designations on the project site from very low density residential and private open space to resort hotel. The resort hotel zone allows for the development of hotels and resorts with limited ancillary commercial uses, such as spas, recreational facilities, restaurants, lounges, and small retail shops that directly support the primary use. Although the specific plan will guide development on the site, changing the underlying zoning designation to resort hotel 
will provide more consistency between the specific plan and the general plan. The proposed specific plan is intended to guide future development and use of the land within the Porcupine Creek specific plan boundary, including the establishment of site-specific development standards and regulations. The specific plan is intended to ensure quality development consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the general plan. The project will maintain the established buffer conditions, which include golf course fairways, an open space buffer of 250 feet along the northeasterly boundary of the project site. The buffer will provide separation and a park-like appearance between the retreat uses and the existing neighboring residences. No new habitable buildings will be constructed within the buffer area, only accessory structures related to retreat uses, such as gazebos and gatehouses. Any structure constructed within the 250 foot buffer area will be limited to 20 feet in height. The maximum allowed height outside of the buffer area is 50 feet two stories and the maximum building coverage on the site is 250,000 square feet, which equates to about 3% lot coverage over the entire project site. The specific plan guides the preliminary development plan design. The preliminary development plan proposes to reconfigure the existing estate into a six-star resort. The PDP will result in a total site coverage of 1.61% and 42 keys. The PDP proposes the construction of one additional four-bedroom villa, five additional two-bedroom villas, 11 additional one-bedroom villas, five spa cabanas and spa support building, four operation buildings, and a gatehouse on Mirage Road. Circulation improvements will include improved and new fire department access. The site will also include golf cart paths and parking along the Western Service Road. The specific plan sets a minimum 50 foot setback to structures, excluding gatehouses or utility structures. There is also the previously mentioned 250 foot buffer alongside the existing residential uses. The proposed PDP meets the requirements. Guests will primarily arrive by retreat, limousine, taxi, or similar transportation to the resort. If coming by personal vehicle, they will be separated from their cars upon arrival and shuttled to and from their accommodations by golf carts. Valet parking will be provided. Vehicle parking is proposed along the access road along the Magnesia North Flood Channel for staff, grounds, and maintenance employees, as well as vehicles of retreat guests. The Porcupine Creek specific plan requires 2.5 parking spaces per key. The applicant is proposing 42 keys, thus 105 parking spaces are required for guest and employee parking. The applicant meets the requirements. Golf cart parking will be available throughout the property. The proposed colors and materials would match the existing property. The architecture and design of the Porcupine Creek Retreat is a modern take on traditional Mediterranean inspired construction. The use of minimalist detailing, large exterior openings and integrated lighting creates a warm and calm environment. Some of the proposed materials include white oak, teak and mahogany woods. All colors and materials are desert appropriate and incorporate the natural environment. The shown elevations provide examples of the typical architecture on site. The existing main house was built in 1997 and features varying roof lines and large overhangs representative of the Mediterranean influence. Large openings provide plentiful light and framed views of the landscape and gardens surrounding the structure. The proposed renovations will focus on converting the existing residential spaces into areas that are more functional for the guest experience at the retreat. The existing casitas are single bedroom structures that are accessible from the exterior. Arches, columns, and tile roofing are common features. The proposed villas and accessory structures incorporate consistent Mediterranean influence and elements with matching stonework, roof style, and wood materials. Large expanses of windows allow natural light to fill the space. The heights proposed outside of the buffer zone range from the 12 foot high operational buildings to the 35 foot high main house. There are no structures currently proposed over 35 feet in height and the majority of structures measure under 20 feet in height. 
The two gatehouses fall within the buffer zone and are under 16 and a half feet in height. Landscaping around the property is strategically designed to frame views to the surrounding mountains and valley using natural boulders, trees, shrubs, and ground cover. In existing areas, the landscape improvements will be minor and will be focused on creating a seamless blend between the existing and new developments. Canopy trees such as tipu, palo verde, and varying species of palms will be planted throughout the property. Tree sizes range from 24 inch to 48 inch box trees with the majority of canopy shade trees measuring 48 inch boxes. Bougainvillea, red cape honeysuckle, and desert spoon are some of the shrubs and ground covers proposed. Shrub and ground cover sizes range from five gallon to 15 gallon plantings. The preliminary development plan is broken up into nine zones. The first zone consists of the main house, four guest casitas, and the existing tennis club house. 1,000 square feet will be added to the main house as part of the resort expansion. The existing main house will function as the lobby and restaurant area and will include guest rooms. Zone two also includes all existing facilities. These include the fitness pavilion and pool bar. There will be upgrades to the existing pool and spa and adjacent decking for commercial compliance. All disturbed areas will be landscaped to match the existing site. Zone three includes the existing golf clubhouse, which will remain as is with minimal improvements. Zone four will include the development of new spa cabanas. A total of eight cabanas would be included in the site build out, but five are planned with the initial development of the property alongside a spa support building. Each spa treatment cabana is 1,132 square feet in size and is located along an existing lake edge. Zone five includes four existing and four new villas. The construction will include a mixture of one, two, and four bedroom villas. Zone six consists of 13 new villas of varying sizes. Zone seven will feature four new operations buildings and an existing substation yard and existing solar carport. Zone eight consists of four existing villas Minor hardscape improvements are planned at each villa and no new square footage is proposed. The final zone, zone nine, includes the Dunes View and Mirage Road entries. Dunes View is the main entry and no changes are proposed. The Mirage Road entry will function as security and check-in for staff and service personnel and a new gatehouse is proposed. The entitlement package includes a development agreement between the city and developer. Some of the provisions include that the developer shall pay development impact fees on all new development. The 250 foot buffer zone must be maintained. All construction truck traffic and deliveries shall be directed to access the project site from Mirage Road to avoid impacts to the Magnesia Falls neighborhood. Violation of the provision may result in a $1,000 fine for each occurrence and the retreat is limited to 50 keys maximum. Staff has distributed all public, public comments prior to the meeting, and that concludes my presentation, and the applicant and I are here to answer any questions. Thank you, Mina. Uh, I'd like to invite up the uh, applicant uh, team at this point to make some comments. Thank you. Mayor Hobart and honorable members of the council, good afternoon. My name is Jim Vaughn and I am the land use counsel for the applicant. First, I want to thank, take a moment and thank Mina and Jeremy and the entire city team for their hard work on this project. We've been working with city staff for more than two years. And as you can, as you can tell from the thickness of your packet, staff's review of this project has been very thorough. And throughout that process, they've been very responsive uh, to meetings and uh, communications as needed. So we appreciate that. As a result of their extensive effort and the hard work of our team, we are very proud of the project being presented today. Two members of our team are gonna make a brief presentation to complement the staff report. Paul DiPilatis of MSA Consulting will complement that staff report uh, with a few more key aspects of the plan 
And we're also very excited to have Kevin Kelly here today. He is the CEO of the planned retreat operator, Sensei. And he'll introduce you to Sensei and to the planned uh, operations at the retreat. We also have the entire technical team available if there are any questions. We have the EIR consultant, we have the traffic consultants available by Zoom, the project architects, the landscape architects, and two representatives of the ownership team. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Paul. Mayor, members of the council, uh, my name is Paul DePilatus. I'm the planning director for MSA Consulting, uh, the city's local uh, uh, engineering firm. We have our offices up on uh, Bob Hope Drive in the city. Um, MSA's involvement on this property has gone on for 10 years now since the property was purchased in 2011. And so our technical reputation stands behind the design of the project as far as civil engineering and surveying and the other aspects of that. MSA uh, has managed the entitlements of this project, uh, including the specific plan, which is the regulatory or programmatic document that describes the allowable uses, development standards, and design guidelines that would guide the development of the project, and also the uh, preliminary development plan uh, prepared by the project architect, which details out how that specific plan is implemented uh, at the uh, level of building footprints and that sort of thing. Um, together, these, these provide a, a very clear picture of the design intent that will occur as the pro property develops. A few highlights, which uh, Mina's uh, presentation was very thorough. Um, but first, uh, all new construction within the, will occur within the existing development footprint of the estate. So there will be no disturbance of new land. Everything will be embedded within the current golf course. Um, and other uh, roadways and things that um, are currently at the estate. Um, secondly, this is an all-inclusive resort. So once the guest arrives, pretty much everything they need is provided uh, within the confines of the, of the project. Um, so there will be minimal guest trips in and, in and out of the retreat grounds once uh, a guest arrives. Finally, uh, as you could see from a lot of the photos that were presented, uh, this project exhibits the highest quality design, both in terms of high caliber, high caliber materials and also a relentless attention to detail. So this contributes to Rancho Mirage's prestige and image and also broadens the city's national and international brand exposure. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Kelly with Sensei. Thank you, Mayor and Council members and, and staff. Uh, my name is Kevin Kelly. I am the CEO of Sensei. Sensei is a wellness retreat and technology company founded by world-renowned oncologist, Dr. David Agus, and also technology leader and co-founder of Oracle, Larry Ellison. Uh, my background is one in, of sustainable development and also uh, being involved in uh, several other wellness resort retreat companies including Canyon Ranch, one here in, in the desert, and uh, one in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, in addition to Canyon Ranch. You know, Sensei's mission is to guide the world towards greater well-being. So when we think of what we're trying to do, we're always doing it as a mission-based company. How do we create experiences, programs? How do we leverage technology? How do we build evidence-based content to help people develop a healthier lifestyle. So when people come to Sensei, we really try to work with them comprehensively throughout their stay as an, in an immersion experience to really help them find this quiet, reflective time, the time of discovery, and really use that time for figuring out what, what are the things that make their life healthier, emotionally and physically. And it's, it's designed we've, uh, to, 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 to find a very zen, reflective place, and we think both the elegance of Rancho Mirage and, of course, the, the beauty of, of uh, Porcupine Creek really provides a unique opportunity, uh, 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 really a, a jewel box in the desert. The kind of programming that we do is we, 
we work with people what we call through our guides, and our guides are people that have, uh, it's a team with people that have master's degree or PhD in nutrition, exercise, physiology, mindfulness coaching, and then they also work with our fitness sports instructors, our spa therapists, our, new, uh, our other forms of nutritionists, um, even our culinary team to work with them on developing a, a game plan. We use both high touch programming, services, activities, all within the campus. And then we also use technology to build what we call a sensei portal. We happen to have some proprietary technology that actually helps to aggregate, collect, aggregate, organize information and gives a tool for the guests to sort of follow their, their healthier living both on campus with us and then when they leave. So it's, a, it's an exciting program. We, we were able to launch the first one uh, on Lanai in Hawaii, where um, it, it's also a Larry Ellison property. And I can tell you that um, working with that development team through, through, uh, and Mr. Ellison, I've never had uh, seen a greater commitment to excellence. And so we, we expect to have that same wonderful experience here in, at uh, Rancho Mirage at Porcupine Creek. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jim and you can, uh, you know, happy to share with you anything else the, that you have interest in with the programming. Thank you. As we wrap up, I just want to let you know that we're aware that increased traffic in the neighborhood is a chief concern. And in the hopes of avoiding any confusion, I want to emphasize a few key facts about the traffic. The traffic study was thor thoroughly addressed the issue of neighborhood traffic and determined that the project would not change the level of service or cause any delays at any locations within the neighborhood. The traffic study utilized a high season baseline condition from pre-COVID conditions. So the study was not affected by the COVID crisis. Employee and deliveries, employee trips and deliveries are required to use the Mirage Road service entrance only. So Dunesview Road is limited to guest trips only. At the planning commission meeting, Commissioner Downs asked the traffic consultant for a realistic assessment of how much would the project increase traffic in the neighborhood. The traffic engineer gave an off the cuff uh, estimate of less than 5%. Well, Fair and Peers, our traffic consultants, examined that issue more thoroughly and prepared a supplemental memo that's in your packets, which concluded that the project could increase traffic in the neighborhood by approximately 4%. Now, I suspect some residents are going to question the assumptions behind that. But those are based on established trip generation rates for single family residents. And that's between nine and 10 total trips a day. Some homes are gonna have more than that and some homes are gonna have less, but that's the average established by traffic engineers. And that may sound a little high, but when you take into account that a single trip to and from work is two trips. Same for a store, you factor in deliveries, and housekeeping and gardeners and kids going to school and suddenly the trip sat up pretty quickly. And then finally, I want to emphasize that the traffic study took a very conservative approach to ensure that any possible traffic impacts have been fully disclosed and analyzed. In particular, the traffic study did not take into account those programming aspects that Mr. Kelly just described. The trips were not reduced because stays are expected to be three to five days and include all immersive programming, including meals and activities. So based on that, we feel very confident that the traffic has been fully analyzed and studied and will not impact the neighborhood. With that, we, our whole team is available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and open up the public hearing on this item. Uh, so if any member of the public wants to participate in the public hearing on the Fort Pine Creek project, now is the time. If you are participating remotely, 
Uh, you can hit the raise hand button on Zoom or a telephone. You would hit star nine to alert us that you would like to participate in the public hearing and make a comment. Before we go to our remote audience, uh, Christy, do we have any speaker cards? We have one, Matt Johnson. Honorable members of the uh, city council, city staff and community members today, I am Matt Johnson. I am the chair of the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. Our executive director, Katie Stice, spoke before the planning commission in support of the Porcupine Creek project. And I'm here to reiterate that message and stress how important this project is to our local business community. I don't need to tell the city council what has happened this past year and what it's been like for businesses, business owners and the employees of the businesses here in our city and the local community. You've seen it every day and you've done what you can as a council and we greatly appreciate that. Today we ask you to continue that help by approving the Porcupine Creek Retreat Project. The conversion of the Porcupine Creek property from a private estate to a six star wellness retreat will place Rancho Mirage among the ranks of the world's most desirable health and wellness destinations. Mm -hmm. This outstanding project will not only have a direct benefit to our local businesses, it will also generate new tax revenues that the city will be able to use to support vital programs for our businesses and the city residents as well. The Porcupine Tree Creek Retreat will make a major contribution to the overall attractiveness of Rancho Mirage tourism. This project will strongly complement Rancho Mirage as a first class health and wellness destination, and it will play a vital part in bringing our economy back to where we all want it to be. We encourage you to approve the plans for the Porcupine Creek Retreat today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, is there anyone else here in person? Yeah, that didn't fill out a card. Come on up. Uh, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Hello, my name is Susan Shear. I live at um, on Helger Road, which is uh, puts the project in my backyard. And I'm just concerned with helicopter um, helicopters flying in and out. I saw that there were helicopter pads, and that hasn't been addressed uh, today. So I was wondering, are people going to be flying in and out? These are a lot of very wealthy people. I'm sure that they have access to other um, types of transportation, but is that going to be an issue? Thank you. Uh, we, we will address the uh, public comments all together at the end. So uh, anyone else here in person? Yeah, come forward. Sorry, moving a little slowly today. My name is Ann Winchester. I am with the Rancho Mirage Community Association. My comments today are directed to those who are testifying or have previously testified about this particular project. We have, um, we're pretty sure where the vote will go at the end of the day. So to provide better communication, the RMCA will be creating a committee to monitor the impacts of the development of the Porcupine Creek project. We have had an invitation to meet with Porcupine Creek personnel. So if you want to be included in that, and here I'm talking to people who might be further testifying, please speak your name clearly uh, during the um, <clears throat> planning commission hearing with masks and uh, people being located elsewhere. It was hard to get everybody's name down. So I can, yeah, okay, that's what I had to say. <laughs> we spoke to Mr. Kelly after the last meeting, and we are in the process of setting up a meeting with Porcupine Creek personnel. If you wish to be part of that meeting or be notified about that meeting, you can always contact me at info at rmcanews.org. We would um, like very much and are very pleased 
to have finally made a contact. It was suggested that such a meeting happen at the um, planning commission meeting and um, the people from Porcupine Creek followed up. And even though we had hoped it would be much sooner than this, we will look forward to mid-April and that meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else here in person that wishes to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no one else here in person, we will go to our remote audience. First one is Paul Herman. Hi, this is Paul Herman. I'm actually the traffic one of the traffic consultants on the project, so I, I don't have anything to speak on. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move to Jessica Christensen. Uh, Jessica, if you're there, we cannot hear you. Uh, Christy, start with the names that have the hand next to them. Okay. Okay. Andy Carpenter. This one. Hi, uh, we're actually two people. Uh, my name is Amelia Carpenter. Um, go, go ahead and make your comment, and then the second speaker can introduce themselves after you're finished and make their comment. Thank you so much. My name is Amelia Carpenter. I live on the corner of Dunes View and Gardess, so our house is actually the closest to the main entrance to the estate. Um, I live there with my husband, my one-year-old son, and in just a couple weeks, we are going to have a daughter as well. Uh, we moved here from Anaheim to raise our family, and we chose this specific location because it is quiet and safe. We moved here envisioning our children playing in the front yard and riding bikes in the street and walking to school. And unfortunately, with this project um, passing, we won't be able to do those things anymore as anticipated. Uh, already, we have trucks, dust, and sound coming from the projects that they're working on unrelated to the resort. Uh, the trucks are supposed to be going to the Mirage Road entrance, but, but often they do not. And at least once a day, we do have a truck sometimes parked and idling in front of our house, waiting to hear from the gate to go to the other side. So that has not been fully addressed. On top of that, the traffic estimate is wildly inaccurate. The idea that 5,000 cars come and go every day from our neighborhood is simply not true. Many neighbors are one person per household. They are retired or disabled, and a lot of the homes near us are unoccupied. So my question is, for whom is Rancho Mirage looking out? Uh, Sensei, the company, is concerned only with the calm and quiet reflective time and health of the richest people on earth. This has nothing to do with our local community uh, and the neighbors and I will never see behind those gates. How can the city ignore the concerns of neighbors impacted most by this change? And I want you to, as a member of the community, imagine a driveway of a hotel being built in your front yard. If you were in opposition, I would understand, I would stand with you, and I would support you. What this boils down to is that commercial traffic does not belong on residential streets. So on behalf of the kids of Magnesia Falls Cove, thank you for taking this into consideration. And I will pass it to my husband. Hi, my name is Andy Carpenter. Um, as my wife said, our, our primary concern, and really our only concern, is traffic. And we believe that the traffic study that was done is inaccurate and insufficient. And the assessment, the way they assess current traffic in this neighborhood is based on numbers for a typical neighborhood. But this is not a typical neighborhood. There are many people that are retired, many work from home, and many only live here part time. And, and, and for anyone that lives in this neighborhood, 
it's obvious that there are not 5,000 trips going in and out of this neighborhood every day. That may be in normal for a typical neighborhood where there's multi-generation or multi, you know, cars and everybody's full time, but that's, that's not what's happening in our neighborhood. And, and on June's view, you know, many people walk up and down that street who live in the neighborhood. There are no sidewalks. It's very dark at night. So the idea of a constant flow of traffic is going to drastically change the mood of this neighborhood for the people that that live here. Um, the traffic study compared the, the 50 keys to 50 rooms at an all suites hotel. But but the you know the the keys, the villas at the estate have up to four rooms each. There could be eight people per key. So it's not a fair comparison. Um, they did a study. The traffic study locations, the six locations are all too far from the entrance to really get a sense of what's really going on because all of the traffic will flow right next to our house on the corner of Dunes View and Gardes. Um, it really needs to be studied from that standpoint as well. Um, there's, the, there's not a stop sign uh, nearby where our home is. And we, we are concerned that uh, with the number of guests and the number of workers that the you know one and a half or two and a half parking spaces per per key is not going to be sufficient and ultimately there will be overflow into our neighborhood and this also this estimate also assumes there are no guests that the that the guests don't themselves have guests visiting them so we don't know what that impact is as my wife mentioned we have work trucks coming every day i know they're not supposed to they're supposed to go to the mirage road entrance but yet they do so um, you know, we'll, we'll have to be holding them accountable for that as well. So those are just some of our concerns. Um, a, a neighbor of mine, Harry Marshak, uh, ha had to work today, couldn't do the meeting, but he wrote a letter that I hope um, you guys will be able to read um, so that that doesn't get ignored as well because he submitted that. So thank you for, for your time and, and um, and yeah, we just invite anyone to uh, to come to our neighborhood, step in front of our house, and see what it's really like here to really understand the impact. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Max Mitchell. Are you there, Max? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. My name is Max Mitchell. I live on Gardes Road, the street that, uh, as you all know, borders the estate. Um, I see we're limited to three minutes, so I'll be, I'll be brief. I was at the Planning Commission meeting, and uh, lots of questions were asked by not just only the commissioners, but the public. And uh, it was interesting to me that uh, the sensei, uh, the, the uh, a company proposing this retreat answered the questions of the commissioners, but they didn't answer the questions of the residents. So I, I, I'm sure that there's a reason for that. I talked to many people in the neighborhood who said they wouldn't, why am I wasting my time talking to the Rancho Mirage City Council? Because it's a foregone conclusion and they don't listen to the public anyway, they just do what they want. So I don't know if that's true, but I, I think you should be aware that an awful lot of people think that you're just a rubber stamp for this and that you're not listening to the residents. I moved here because it was quiet, it was peaceful, and for the first time in my life, I could live in a beautiful place like this, that, that I could walk my dog, down the middle of the street at midnight. And um, this is, uh, retreat is going to take all of this away from me. I think the traffic study is flawed, um, as the previous guest uh, stated, that the traffic, the traffic statistics talk about averages for the neighborhood. You were talking about averages earlier. But the concentration of traffic at the gate at Gardes and Dunesview, that's what needs to be studied, not the average for uh, uh, traffic blocks and blocks away from this. Um, and so I, I really believe the traffic study is, is flawed. Um, and, uh, uh, and also there were supposed to be no buildings built, uh, new buildings. There's a new building at the corner of Magnesia Falls Drive and Gardes that was built very recently. It's a service building, so it's not an occupied building. It's the ugliest building in the neighborhood and it towers above the fence and we can still see it. Um, so, uh, 
I just wonder when when this property was sold in 2011, and Mr. Ellison purchased purchased it with the intention of doing this 10 years ago. Wow! And you know, we moved here, and we heard the only reason that estate was approved was it was they were told that they could only be residential. It was never to be zoned commercial. And now here we are zoning it commercial. What's going to happen in two years? It's going to be upgraded to 100 keys for a Hyatt. And another two years to 200 keys for a Hilton. Another two years is going to be upgraded to a Holiday Inn with 300 rooms. And then in, in 10 years, it'll be God knows what with 300 rooms because Rancho Mirage doesn't keep its word. We had a restriction on this property and you're going to keep changing it and it's going to keep going up and up and up. What reason do we have to believe that Rancho Mirage City Council keeps its word? Also, if it's all inclusive, the you're, people are trying to say that the guests, Please wrap up your leave, comment. the guests never leave. Well, how do they know that? How do you know that? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Wendy Brooks. Yes. Uh, shift command. Are you, are you there, Wendy? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. I've been a resident of the Magnesia Falls Cove neighborhood for five years in a branch of Mirage for 14 years. I strongly request that the city council vote no on this proposal for the Porcupine Creek retreat. I'm concerned about having a commercial hotel inside a quiet residential community that's surrounded on three sides by mountains. Having read the traffic study of several concerns that were not addressed, some of which have been brought up by other people, I believe the city council needs to reject the recommendation of the planning commission as it is now and require careful study of the project's impact on the neighborhood and should rely heavily on the concerns from the residents in the neighborhood who will be most affected by this project. I live four houses in from Dunes View on Halgar, which is one block from the entrance of this um, proposed main entry. Dunes View, for those of you who are not familiar with Magnesia Falls, runs through the middle of this cove community. It's smack in the middle of the cove community. Okay? There are other access points to this property that go around the of the cove, but you are planning on putting in the, the access road through the middle of our quiet residential community where people walk and bike and there are no stop signs and there are no traffic lights and it's just not safe for people walking. Um, the traffic study said that the project will operate similarly to how the property, proper, property currently operates. This seems completely false since the current property is a supposed to be a private residence and the new project is a hospitality business that's going to serve a lot more people, a lot more people. And so that seems just like a false assumption. Um, and the current traffic volume doesn't seem to be estimating who will be joining us. The traffic study did not collect data from the intersections that will be most affected. And yes, they will all funnel into Dunes Road from Halgar and from Gardes coming up the sides. And that was not assessed at all, at all. Um, the closest area that was assessed is a half a mile from the entrance gate at Dunes View and Gardes. And the closest um, stop sign is at Mirage, which is also about a third of a mile down the road. There are no other stop signs in the area, okay? And again, many of us walk our dogs, walk ourselves. There are many older people who live in this neighborhood. There are many corners where it's very difficult at this point to be seen around the corner when a car is coming. And so that is a concern. I agree that the concern for the greater well-being of the guests at this hotel was mentioned with a complete disregard for the greater well-being of the people who already live in this beautiful neighborhood. In addition, I don't really believe that they will not leave the property because people come to Rancho Mraz for the fine dining and for our wonderful natural beauty and hikes. And it would make sense that people are spending the money to come here would want to do that as well. You're out of time. Please wrap up your comment. I did. Thank you. Next speaker is 
Harry Marshak. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I didn't think I could make it. Uh, I got out of uh, my surgery a little early. So um, I had sent a letter to the council, as the previous speaker said, but I'm going to uh, just read the letter then. Um, I've lived in Rancher Ul Mirage for 15 years. I've lived in Nagisha Falls Cove for over five years. And I requested the city council vote no on this proposal for Porcupine Creek Retreat as it stands now. Putting a commercial hotel inside a residential neighborhood that is surrounded on three sides by mountains is an almost unheard of situation and therefore requires careful study of the project's impact on the neighborhood and should rely heavily on the input from its residents, from the residents of the neighborhood surrounding the property. And I have several concerns about the project as it is uh, detailed in the proposal. Number one, the traffic study compared 50 keys at this retreat to, a, to 50 rooms at an all suite hotel. The keys in the proposed retreat refer to villas, which can have up to four rooms in each villa, and each room could accommodate two people per room. And this could allow up to eight people per key. So I looked at the all suites hotel and I found one in Las Vegas and that offers rooms with one bedroom with one king or two queen beds. There's an embassy suites hotel in Palm Desert which offers one bedroom rooms with one king or two queen beds. Their executive suite has one bedroom with two queen beds. Therefore, it is inappropriate and misleading to use the all suites model to estimate the traffic volume that this project would bring to the neighborhood. Two, the, the traffic study relied on data that the city collected at six, six locations. The location nearest the property is at Sahara and Dunes View. This location is almost one half mile from the entrance to the property. This is too far from the entrance to be relied on. An independent, tra an independent traffic study at Dunesview and Gardess Road should be required and compared to alternate entrance sites at Magnesia Falls Drive and at Mirage Road and at Indian Trail for comparison and to decide which is the best entrance. Three, the traffic from each of these six traffic study locations in the traffic report will all funnel to the entrance at Dunesview and Gardess Road, which was said. Four, the nearest stop sign to the proposed entrance, which was said, is at Dunesview and Mirage uh, Road, which is a third of a mile from the entrance. Five, Dunesview Road is in the middle of, of the neighborhood in Magnesia Falls Cove. It has no sidewalks. It's very dark at night. Many of us currently walk our dogs at night with flashlights. So I would invite members of the city council to come uh, to Dunesview Road after dark and walk with me and my wife and our black dog to see how safe they would feel with the added traffic of tourists who are following their GPS to the resort entrance on Dunes View. Um, You're out of time. A couple Please more wrap points up your comment. quickly. Um, it's inappropriate to assign 1.5 parking spots per four room villa slash key. And uh, lastly, um, the cumulative effects portion of the traffic report did not uh, take the uh, proposed in and out burger development into account. So I conclude saying the city council has moved to stop vacation rentals in our neighborhood in order to reduce disruption to the residents. And I would hope that the city council will extend that attitude to this proposed project as well and require further study prior to its approval. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker is Bettina Ross Marino. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm actually here to speak on a, agenda item number 12, but I felt compelled to speak on agenda item number 11. The representatives for Porcupine Creek spoke about landscaping, and I'd like to be a voice to ask that as landscaping needs are reviewed, the developers strongly consider keeping intact natural desert scape. In other words, don't grade and bulldoze existing natural scape just to put back desert landscaping particularly as it relates to the Coachella Valley ground squirrels habitat, which is a species of special concern with state fish and wildlife. Please leave the existing desert in place and beautify from there. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Brad Anderson.
Yes, hi, thank you, uh, Brad Anderson, City Ranch Mirage, uh, Fervor Drive. It's uh, this project will immediately, you know, affect me where I live, uh, but uh, I, I just heard the uh, spokesman uh, state that it pro would it affect traffic patterns in that neighborhood and and any any construction and any any uh, changing of the. Uh, the use of that property would, of course, change the uh, traffic patterns in any neighborhood. So uh, I know this is probably going to be approved, uh, and uh, just like other projects like the In-N-Out and so forth. Uh, and I'm all for property rights and, and having people do what they want, but this is a unusual, very unusual when you have to drive through a residential area to get to any type of resort. Uh, and uh, see what else was I going to say something about, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, yeah I'm I'm opposed to this, but uh, uh, I know it's going to happen. So I think if when you do things like this, you need to, you need to mitigate and mitigate with the people that's going to be the most affected, and those are the people that are on the main drives to that uh, the gate or the main gates or the even the service gates. So. Uh, buy those properties, do what you have to to mitigate those, and uh, that's about all you can do. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is just identified as Patsy. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you please uh, uh, state your name for the record? Hi, my name is Patsy Bauman. I live on Tunis Road. Um, I've been with my husband here for five years. We moved from Orange County to get away from um, all the hustle and bustle. We're very aware of what goes on in a hotel zone. We've um, lived within the shadow of Disneyland for, or we did for my entire time living there. Um, and I just wanted to add a couple of things. I completely agree 100% with everyone else who spoke. I'm also aware that with what's going on up there already and all the trucks and all the noise and all of the things that are currently happen happening, that this is not going to stop. You know, what we say here really isn't going to matter. Um, we as people don't really honestly care how beautiful it is inside the gates. It's probably going to be lovely. We'll never get to see it. So that really doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is walking our children, walking our dogs, and being in our quiet neighborhood. The answer to being in our quiet neighborhood isn't putting in more stop signs for more cars. It isn't putting in more lights for more cars and people looking at their GPS, although that would help. The answer is not to have all of those cars and all of those people coming up and down our streets. I too would like to add about the, the study and it was uh, mentioned prior about the older people in the neighborhood, few homes, not very many people here full time. I 100% agree with that. On my street, I can see maybe a dozen cars a day. Um, my street is small, but I see almost no one. I'm home all day, I'm a school teacher, so I can watch what's coming and going. I zoom from home. So yeah, there will be a huge increase and to say that it won't matter, that doesn't, that's not okay and it's not fair and it's not the truth. So I appreciate it. I hope all the people that get to go there have a great time. I have no contention with that. Have a great time. But it doesn't matter to us. What matters is what we do already own and what we do and our lives and our lives matter too. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. And that was the last speaker. Okay. Uh, seeing no one else that wishes to participate in the public hearing, uh, we mm -hmm. will close that portion of the meeting. And uh, Mina, can you address the uh, helicopter issue that was raised? Yes, I can, Mr. Hagerman. Uh, Section 8.25 of the Municipal Code governs the landing of aircraft and only allows landing upon an airport, aircraft landing field, or other area approved by the City Council. The proposed project does not proposed, nor is it approved for any helicopter landings. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I will turn this over to the council. Does any member of the council have uh, Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have several questions I would like to ask. Go forward. Okay. Uh, first of all, Mina, could you once again tell us how many one bedrooms there are going to be and how many two bedrooms and how many four bedrooms on build out? 
pond build out of the PDP, there will be three four bedroom villas, uh, 10 two bedroom villas, 12 one bedroom villas, and uh, 13 rooms inside of the main house and four casitas, which have one bedroom. And four casitas. Okay. And how many employees are presently going in the gates today, every day? And how many will be going in on build out? The existing site currently has 84 full-time employees, which are about 60 daily. Um, the resort proposes 147 full-time employees, which would equate to about 105 a day. 105 a day. Okay. And uh, also, uh, you talk about keys, which sounds like there's keys to a unit. However, uh, how many total people are can be accommodated as guests there? And are there possibilities to have extra spare beds or extra beds put in to any of the rooms? I'll let the applicant address the spare beds, but for the PDP build out, the maximum number of bedrooms would be 64, which would equate to about 128 people on site. Um, the maximum 50 key build out would equate to about 94 bedrooms and 188 people on site. So on build out, there's going to be 188 guests on site. And uh, who can address putting extra beds or cots into a, a bedroom? Can you please address that, whoever might be able to? Yes, he's uh, coming up to the podium now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. <clears throat> right, right now, um, we have absolutely no plans to have either extra beds or even rooms that have couches, let those be pullout couches. So the answer is we have no plans at all to have any kind of extra roll-in beds or pull-out couches that would uh, see, uh, have uh, other people. The, the second is, um, you're, if you do a unit count um, on, or a bed count with two people in every bed, um, the, you have to look at it also as an average. What's the average with over the year? And you, you know, you're, we're, we're looking at probably a 60 or 7% occupancy with on average about one and a half people per, per room. So just that's that's the normal math of it. And then when we look at the the density, you're looking at four to five acres per key. So those are those are different than just a, a traditional hotel, of course. Okay. And uh, have you given, made any plans or have thought about uh, having guests arrive through the main entrance? And uh, I know you're anticipating that no one will be leaving. However, I believe that. Uh, it's uh, mentioned that people will be going out and uh, some of the businesses will be depending on sure. people leaving the compound and if you're going to restaurants when you're doing going to other businesses and if people are going to be leaving is there any possibility that they can be using uh, the entrances uh, that are now being used by staff uh, no, we wouldn't want that. We'd want to have segregate the um, service entrance from the guest entrance. Uh, that would be pr primarily how we would look at that, unless unless there was a unique circumstance or we were driving them in a van that we were driving. Um, I, by the way, when we use the word immersion, it doesn't mean no one ever leaves. I mean, obviously, by definition, if they come, they leave. And yes, we, we would never say they would never, ever want to go out to the city. But what we're saying is, unlike a hotel operation, a retreat is designed to be an inclusive experience where you stay on property, you eat there, and you take the, you have you're probably doing five or six activities or classes or lectures a day. So okay. it's pretty and what what are you anticipating for construction time, and what about trucks idling in front of people's homes? Well, I'm I'm the operator of the retreat. I'm not the developer. Um, I will tell you that as a as an operator, we we also do not like the noise of construction, which is temporary. Obviously, it's a but um, so I'd have to have the uh, developer uh, have Jim answer that specific question. Okay. Thank you. 
with respect to construction timing, uh, it's anticipated that fairly limited construction will occur uh, prior to initial opening, and the target is to open as soon as possible, hopefully as early as uh, the end of this year. So after that, the, the PDP authorizes 42 total uh, rooms, of which there's about 25 that exist today. So those additional rooms would be added incrementally in the probably the summer and early fall months uh, over time as, as operations kind of establish what the market is and what's needed. So there won't be a mass of 30 new buildings getting built at one time or even 10 new buildings at one time. So very incremental if that answers your question. Okay, so you're gonna, so this project as these uh, buildings are built is gonna be over a long period of time. It could extend over the life of the project, but again, as has happened at the property for the last 10 years, in uh, off-season times, an improvement is done here and an expansion is done there. So what we're expecting is the construction to not seem a lot uh, more than what has been experienced in the last 10 years. And at least at the Planning Commission hearing, the testimony was that Mr. Ellison's been a much better neighbor than previously the prior occupant and owner, and that uh, he's been a good neighbor. So I took that to mean that over the last 10 years, although maybe uh, inconvenient in, at limited times, it's been pretty good, and we don't expect it to change very much. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, there is a street that is a dead end, the dead ends at the property, where there's a gate to the east side of the street, and it looks like people would enter there to for, as, for hiking. Is that true? And is that street going to be used for anything else, or will that be opened up, uh, or was, is it going to be remaining uh, just for hikers? There are no current access points proposed for hikers on site. Okay, and then when you uh, talk about the buffer zone, uh, you mentioned also it's uh, and I know a couple people complained that the wall uh, on, that separates their backyard from the buffer zone uh, is a very low wall. Is that going to be addressed? Uh, will those walls be raised? Wall heights are not proposed to be raised. Uh, currently, the existing condition would remain. Okay, and you mentioned also about gazebos being built possibly in the buffer zone. Uh, what would be the purpose of building gazebos there and who would be using them? Gazebos were just an example of an accessory structure that could potentially be built within the zone. The zone allows uh, structures under 20 feet in height to be built in that zone with a minimum of a 10 foot setback. Um, the 20 foot height limit corresponds to the height that the residential uses adjacent also have. Uh, it would just be for retreat guests or as an accessory structure to the resort. Okay, thank you for answering all those questions, everybody. Because um, I, as you can see, I do have a number of concerns. Um, and as we move forward, you know, there is no guarantees as people have mentioned, as far as ownership, as far as uh, extension of the uh, accommodations for guests, you know, two years down the line, what is that property going to look like? Four years down the line, what is it going to look like? Uh, what is the traffic going to look like? Um, you know, we have gone through a lot of um, soul searching and studying uh, related to businesses in our neighborhoods. And uh, we just uh, recently uh, eliminated the STRs in neighborhoods, except for um, uh, developments that are run by HOAs. And as much as I would love to see um, certain things uh, take place uh, to provide a more peaceful way of life, for the neighbors in that area. I don't know what proposals could be suggested, but at the weight that this is proposed at this time, 
with so many employees and the possibility of 188 people as guests coming to visit and people coming and going, especially with our school there and with the uh, traffic, with the construction. Unfortunately, at this point, I will be voting against this project. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a statement if I may. Yes, Charlie. You know, I, I hear, I was at the uh, Planning Commission meeting and listened to it all. And I think that this developer and everybody involved in it answered, addressed a lot of questions that were answered then. There's still a couple of things that kind of gnaw at me. And I think maybe we can clear this up today to be able to move forward. The wording keeps coming up. This is a hotel. In what I'm reading, this is a luxury resort. Um, resort to me in the exclusiveness as this, and forgive me for my uh, putting it in the text of uh, Betty Ford or a uh, reduced farm where ladies go to lose weight or a uh, psychological building that people come and get um, rejuvenated mentally and move on and that they come in and they stay for four weeks to go through a program. That's what I think a resort or spa is. What I think the residents of Ranch Mirage are looking at is, if you're going there for one of these services that I just mentioned, why do you need to stay in a four bedroom or three bedroom villa? If it's just usually when, when you're going to be uh, detoxed or lose weight, you go there by yourself for the privacy and for the expertise that you're going there and paying for to help you as a spa resort. So Jim, I don't know which one of you want to answer this question, but I certainly understand the question, is it a resort? <clears throat> and if I were living up there, why do you need four bedrooms? And I know that this really hasn't been answered. So are you bringing in your family? Is it really, is it really like a Ritz-Carlton? Is it a hotel? And I think this is the concerns of the people that are asking these questions who live up there. What actually is it? And I urge you to try to explain what I just said to the residents of the Cove in Rancho Mirage so that they can be put at somewhat of ease. Now, that's my point with that. <clears throat> the other thing is what came up at the Planning Commission. Council member, is, would, would you like a response? Jim's at the podium. Yeah, Jim, and I have a couple more things okay. and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> is it a restaurant? This was another thing that came up at that meeting, meaning the uh, commission that looked at this and approved. So along with what Iris is saying, I think the biggest thing, Jim, that you can answer is my question of what is it and what will it really generate? Why do you need four bedrooms and three bedrooms and two? How long will the stays be? I'll stop there. Thank you, Councilmember Townsend. I appreciate the chance to, to answer that. Those are actually very good questions and I think clarity on this issue is extremely important. So with respect to the PDP that's before you as part of this today's entitlements, they've already identified and located 42 of the allowable 50 keys. And there is not an allowance for any further expansion beyond that. It's limited, 50 keys max now and in the future for the 20 or maybe even 25 year term of the development agreement. So that's not open for negotiation or discussion. 50 is the max. Of those keys, 42 have already been planned and cited, 28 of those. So the vast majority are one bedroom units. They're either bedrooms in the main house 
or their single casitas or single bedroom units. There's about 10 total two bedroom units. And there's only a, a maximum of four, four bedroom units, some of which already exist. And yes, that is designed to accommodate families when they travel. That's obviously at four out of 42, that's not anticipated to be the typical guest. Typical would be one or two people in a one bedroom unit, but that we do want to accommodate families. And so there are just a few four bedroom units. As Mina mentioned, so for those 42 out of the 50 keys that are already planned, the maximum occupancy, if every room is maxed out, is 128 people. Even with the additional or the total number of employees, which includes taking care of the golf course, the grounds, everything, if there's 105 employees there during the day, that's 230 something people on the property out of almost 300 acres, less than a person an acre. So we're not talking about a high density use. This is not like you see at a hotel pool in April. It's the opposite. So I hope that answers the question about uh, the bedrooms. You asked about the restaurant. That is purely to service the guests staying at the retreat. It will not be open to the public, nor will any of the amenities at the site be open to the public. Not allowed. Before you oh, sit Jim, down, Jim, Jim let me a... ask you this, if I may, one, one more thing. How can you address the concern that everybody still is talking about the traffic? And I know at one point there was somebody that asked at the planning commission when it was given, these huge trucks are coming up, they know how are they going to turn around and go back down? The answer, as I remember it, is it was told by you guys. There's a turnaround when they go through the gates and come back, so that would never happen. But I think it's very important for you guys right now to try to address the concern of people when it comes to traffic up and down their neighborhoods, which they're considering it a constant thing. They do not believe the study, Jim. So, answer. We completely understand and are sympathetic to the issue of construction traffic and there were a number of tr construction traffic concerns brought to our attention on the, the last year's um, buildings at the site, the work done at the site um, last year. It was brought to our attention and immediately the construction operators and team were called to task. Uh, people were situated, we, we placed people out on the roads to make sure the trucks are both not speeding and using the correct route to get out on Mirage Road only. And the number of complaints went down dramatically. So that was a good uh, learning experience for us. And I think going forward, you'll see that those issues will be addressed. And yes, could somebody make a wrong turn one time? Maybe one time, but they're gonna get fined and they're gonna have problems. And so we are taking those seriously and addressing them. With respect to the overall traffic, again, Employees and deliveries all have to use Mirage Road and the service entrance. So we've limited the dunes view where most of the folks that spoke today live on or near to only guest traffic. And again, the traffic study assumed a worst case scenario. It assumed that this operates like a typical all suites hotel, which has sleeping accommodations for four people per key. We have, as I just explained, we have less than that. So it was, it was conservative in that respect. And, and that assumed that that's people coming and going multiple times a day. They're going to their work meeting under a typical all suites hotel. On the weekends, they're going to a soccer tournament or a baseball tournament and back multiple times a day. Those are the trip generation numbers that were used for this operation, despite the fact that the programming at the retreat is the complete opposite of that. People will not be coming and going. A guest comes one time, stays three to five days, leaves. That's two total trips. If they're brought by a, a shuttle service from the airport or a limo from the retreat, that would be four trips total per stay. If, they, if sometime during their, during their stay, they wanted to go shopping or do something in town, that's only another trip or two. So we're not talking about multiple trips a day. We're talking about just a few trips a week. All right, Jim, one, one last, and this is a loaded question. 
Ann Winchester asked for a meeting with your group and people that live up there with their association. Do you feel in your heart of hearts that everything that went on at the Planning Commission, every question that I'm asking you and that Iris asked you and that you heard from people who called in or came to the podium, at that meeting, do you think you can answer and put their minds at ease so that this project can go forward? Very loaded question. Well, I, I think that we will have that meeting. I suspect we'll have more than one meeting going forward. We're determined to be good neighbors. Um, you know, people are rightfully worried about change. That always happens, and we understand that. But in my heart of hearts, yes, I think we are doing and will do everything we can to be good neighbors and to meet and address issues. Right now, we don't have a contract with an operator because we don't have an approved project yet. But if we have an approved project in the immediate future, we will have a contract with Mr. Kelly and Sensei who will be on site and operating and will be responsible for helping address these neighborhood concerns. So it's a, it's a team effort between the developer team and the operator team, and that will be in place soon. And we will be moving forward with Ms. Winchester and the community to make this a good relationship. Now, also on those terms, it's a team effort with the five of us sitting here trying to make a decision to make sure that everybody is happy. And that is a benefit to the city of Rancho Mirage, a feather in our cap, but certainly that the people who live in that cold feel justified in that this council is there for them. So let me just end with this. If this council passes this today to go ahead, can you really say that you will listen to Ann Winchester's group? And if there are any viable situations that you can put their minds at ease and they would be more than happy to listen and make any changes, big or small, little teensy weensy, tell me that. Absolutely, I guarantee it. Thank you, Jim, you've been very fair. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome, uh, Ken. Uh, we have somebody uh, from staff type up uh, the last question and the last answer so that we have it uh, to look at later. Uh, I'd like somebody to do that. Uh, it, it'll be part of the minutes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Ver verbatim on, on that part. Um, Aina, can I uh, just take a couple of minutes and go you forward? Take as many as you'd like. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple of issues dealing with EEIR, but uh, I had a couple of other questions uh, prior to that. One had to do with the property itself, and I understand out of the 230 acres, 191 is going to be part of this development. Um, have you met with the various regulatory agencies uh, concerning the use of that property and the bighorn sheep use? Yes, Councilmember Kite, the uh, various agencies are part of the EIR consultation process. And do you know what the decision was to, to maintaining that uh, property? So council member Kai, they, they didn't have any comments on the EIR and that uh, the vast majority of the land outside the specific plan or, or all the land outside the specific plan boundaries is not being touched or altered in any way. So it will remain in its existing condition. And also, isn't there a watering site that uh, was put in there by the previous owners or the owners now? Yeah, there's supposed to be a water guzzler. Right. Uh, is yeah. that uh, gonna continue as is? Good. If I may add, the Bighorn Institute sent a letter of support for the project. Okay, great. Uh, today we received a letter from Coachella Valley Water District. Have you had an opportunity to look at that and their concerns? Yes, Councilmember Kite, they are standard conditions imposed upon uh, almost every project that the city processes. So there's nothing unique uh, concerning this, the drainage or flood control issues of that channel? No, as previously mentioned, the site is existing um, and any new proposals would need to obtain the appropriate uh, permits and clearances. Okay. Spend a couple of minutes talking about traffic. And this area has always been uh, 
concern of traffic in and out of the Mag Falls area and being a residential area. I, I don't think if you did 100 more traffic studies, you'd probably come up with a, a reasonable solution to the problem. You've got cars, a, a number of cars going through a finite space and, and to the property. And it just seems that uh, one of the issues that we've had in the past was traffic down by Sahara. And one of the ways we resolved that issue was to get together a survey and provide it to the residents and let the residents try and make a decision as to how they think a traffic issue could be handled. Not so much a, a, a study, but a survey more open-ended and uh, you know, you just, if you're going to go through that gate, it's how you get there and how many cars you get there. I think there are going to be cars going back and forth from one end of the property to the other just because you have a, an area that is unknown to the average driver and they're going to pick Mag Falls, they're going to pick uh, Dunes View. It's going to be difficult to really limit the number of cars on that on that area so the uh, the traffic survey is something that i think could help and get everybody looking at the same number of issues uh, traffic also in regard to emergency services can you address the uh, the issue for fire and police services Fire and police services wouldn't be affected. They would still be able to service the property. There may be an increase, uh, but the fiscal impact showed that the city would still benefit uh, fiscally at the end. Okay. Uh, one of the issues that was addressed in EIR was uh, noise. Uh, can you address the issue of uh, special events, fireworks, that sort of thing up in this area? I'll ask Mr. Vaughn to address the special event question. There was a noise study completed as part of the EIR and it showed no significant impact. Well, we, the city also has specific regulations over fireworks and special events as well. But go ahead, Jim. That's correct. And nothing like fireworks are proposed. I don't even think they're allowed without an extra permit from the city. Um, and it would be completely inconsistent with the programming of the, the retreat and wellness operations. With respect to um, special events, the development agreement contains a, a hard limit on that. And I believe the number is no more than 350 people, uh, including the guests, can be on the site for a special event without coming in to the city ahead of time with a traffic and noise management plan to establish that there would be no impacts on the community. Would you envision that such a plan would be forthcoming to the city? Frankly, we don't envision ever needing one because we don't think we're going to have events of that size. Um, but it's in the development agreement just in case over the course of 20 years, if something changed and a special event were proposed, there's a process in place to protect the residents. Okay. And finally, um, looking at the issue of, of special events or revenue generating sources. Can you give us some ideas to what the cost per night for, for rental will be on the various locations? We're going to have Mr. Kelly address that question. <laughs> the, the price We'll probably start at about $650 per night for the room. It will probably go up to, if I have a four bedroom or two bedroom or four bedroom, it will be, it will be probably closer to 1500 to $2,000. There's only two of those four bedrooms. So if I look at it from a point of view of a, using a standard bedroom as the example, you're probably looking at 650 to $700 a night. You're looking at the average length of stay is about three and a half days more like five days for somebody flying in, two and a half to three days for someone driving in. 
Um, so uh, you're so over the over the given week, you're probably at best turning that that facility over once. That's the other thing to be aware of. You're not you're not going to have people coming and doing one nighters. These are program packages for peak performance, health performance, nutrition performance. We'll also have tennis and golf there. There'll be three, four, and five day packages. So the average length of stay and the average rotation is not like a traditional hotel or even a resort. A retreat is a very concentrated time. But the, and so we'll, we'll at best have that, that place turnover once during the week, one full time. The, so three, 650 to $700 Will be will be the what we call the hotel room rate. On top of that, they'll be charged for F and B and for you know for some of our fitness diagnostic and the, the yoga and the spa and other things. Best guess, what would you anticipate will be the TOT from this property? There's an expected one million dollar revenue a year. A little over one million net. Oh. And the last item, just want to get your comment on, is lighting in the area. Are they, the residents on the street adjacent to the buffer zone, are they going to be impacted by any outside a lighting source? The city requires a zero foot candle reading at all property lines, so lighting will not cross property mm -hmm. boundaries. Shielding is also required. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have one more little bit I'd like to throw in, if I may, before Ted goes. Go ahead. And that is, I, I, I would make a statement that I wouldn't think that the city would be adverse to listening to the residents when it comes to stop signs, speed bumps, or anything that has to do with safety on those roads in Ranch Mirage. If this comes up, could we really say that we are there for them to make sure that everything is safely laid out as this project comes into fruition and any changes that need to be made that we would do? Thank you. Charlie, that's 100% uh, that's right. Thank Got to you. get the buy-in from the residents. They <coughs> have, live have, there. have to do it, Richard. We do we have, we have to listen, and we've listened to everybody with this. <clears throat> and I will tell you, we will continue to be listening. Surely, surely, Mr. Mayor, Mayor can I make a comment? Uh, yeah, let me just first, I, something I didn't hear uh, in your comment, Shirley, uh -huh. uh, just restate your point. My point is that the city of Rancho Mirage will take into consideration any uh, normal cases that come up due to traffic or safety when this is built, that we will make any additional corrections to the roadways, whatever it takes to have a safe passage roadway, not for Porcupine Creek, for the residents of Ranch Mirage who are out there walking their dogs. There's, there's where I'm going. We will be there. And I know in the past, Nina, we do do that. So I'm really not asking for anything that's really out of the question. And I know that Jesse knows that too. We are always there. I just want people to realize we're listening to them. Go ahead, Dina. You're suggesting, I gather, that the measure before us be amended to allow for that contingency that you're just you've just explained. That it should be in the document rather than out of the document. Am I right or wrong? If that be needed to make sure that everybody is secure and knowing that they can back and two years and say, well, he said that, but nothing happened. And someone says to them, well, it's not in writing, sorry. Yes, I'd be more than happy to put that in. Mayor, may I make a comment now? Yes, good. Uh, first of all, Charlie, I agree with you entirely. Thank you. And Richard, uh, thank you for your comments as well. Uh, I think that we do take into consideration uh, the residents. Uh, we do listen and we are concerned about uh, their safety and quality of life. When you look at this project, you could not have a lower density uh, than you have on this project. I mean, my gosh, you've got 203 acres 
uh, of which 191 is being developed for 50 bungalows. <coughs> the amount of traffic will be increased approximately, according to the traffic engineer, 4%. But regardless of that, as Charlie points out, we will still look to mitigate wherever it's necessary so that we're going beyond that point. The amount of money that people are going to be spending to go to this luxury spa, and as Mr. Kelly stated, he talked about the room rate, but then he talked about the extras, and those extras have to do with any sort of yoga or massage or golf or some of these other things. When somebody comes there for three or five days, they're spending three, five, seven, ten thousand dollars. They're not going to be leaving this facility very much at all. So that that is going to be the reason that this is a six star resort with an international reputation. And as I've stated many times in the past, we as a council will have a number of projects presented to us over the years that sound good, but the developer can never get the financing to make it a reality. Here we have such a unique situation and a unique opportunity. We have an individual that's willing to go to whatever extent is possible to self-finance this, frankly, six-star resort and get it done. Yes, maybe we have to make some tweaks here and there to provide for safety and security, but it's a, in my opinion, it's a golden, a golden opportunity for the city of Rancho Mirage. It's, it's an opportunity that I think would be tragic if we didn't take advantage of the offer that's being laid before us today. And with that, again, I thank you, Charlie and, and Richard, for the additional suggestions. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Well, Dana, let me ask this. If, if I read the uh, request for recommendation, if I go down to EF, and try to do what I said, would it be proper for me to ask Steve Hugh to put a, a few lines in there to what I'm trying to get across about the future of the roadways and the safety of the citizens of Ranch Mirage? It would be possible, it, it would be possible, but you would pretty much have to uh, postpone acceptance or rejection of this matter until the next meeting or a special meeting uh, so, because uh, if you're not in a position where you have uh, the authority of a mutual, mutually satisfying agreement, you have no authority at all, and you know, that things would resolve. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can can I add something on the uh, topic you guys are discussing? So obviously, what you're talking yes. about is. Uh, here at the city, when we get a neighborhood traffic concern, we have a set process that we go through, which was described uh, by you guys. Um, from a staff perspective, um, you know, repeating that policy into a project specific document has no bearing on the policy in general. You would just simply be, be duplicate what's already on the record. So from my perspective, there is, it is not necessary to put that policy that already exists into a project specific document. You would just Thank be you, duplicating Isaiah. it. So with that, if we are all in accordance. Well, wait a second. No, just a minute. And, and I have a couple more questions okay. because um, uh, Jim had mentioned something that I had not heard before and I found very interesting. Number one, he mentioned that uh, these four bedroom units uh, or maybe two bedroom units would also include families. And does that mean children? And uh, is there any age uh, limitation uh, as far as how young the children might be? And he also mentioned about something about 25 years. 
Does that mean that what we would be passing today would still be in effect 25 years from now? Only if, it was in, <laughs> only if it was in writing, not, not okay. an opinion comment. Exactly. And that, uh, because one of the primo concerns for neighbors in this area is that in, in two years, if this property is sold, or in four years or six years, what is this property going to turn into? And what happens when there are other members on the council other than the five bucks? Are, is that something that we can guarantee at this point? Is, are there conditions that can be included where the neighbors in this Magnesia Falls area will know that this is not going to turn into a Holiday Inn five well, years I, down I the line? Iris, I think this was addressed, if I remember, in, at the Planning Commission. And the answer at that, and correct me somebody if I'm wrong, was that if that would happen, they would have to come to the council, whether this one or a future council, and present a whole new program that would either be voted on or voted out. Because yes, you, can't say, you can't say you can't do this. That's the, right? way, it was that's the way it was presented at the Planning Commission. That's Thank you. Right. That's that, correct. That, that is that's correct. correct and that's yes, why yes. I think that uh, we all need to be aware of the fact that there are no guarantees. That uh, just because there, there are, you know, 50 keys that are going to, that are being proposed, that hmm. there are no guarantees on any level because changes always happen. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. The city attorney, I, I, I don't, I can't figure out how to raise my hand in the context of Zoom. In any event, you know, so one of the benefits of a statutory development agreement, which is being proposed here, is that the all those conditions run with the land, which basically means that if we have a purchaser comes in, a new purchaser, they have to abide by all those regulations and all those conditions of approval. But to the extent that um, the council wants a little bit more assurance with respect to any conditions you want to impose, I'm sure that um, in lieu of continuing this matter that um, Mr. Vaughn and I can, you know, during a recess, can probably iron out some of the details um, if that's what the council wants is more uh, specificity. So, on your point, uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is whether uh, things can change. Uh, all of a sudden, the traffic volume, we'll say, has expanded to uh, 50 or 100 percent more than uh, was anticipated when the contract was finally approved by the council. Um, how do how do we how, how do we protect the homeowner who's walking his kids uh, on the streets, uh, sidewalks? in the vicinity, how do, how do we protect them um, other than with some general statement? I, I don't think we would be in a position to, unless we wrote it in, that, that if the city council makes a finding that uh, the conduct of the developer, uh, of the owner, is uh, creating a uh, hostile or a dangerous situation for uh, residents living at the following addresses, mm -hmm. and that must be corrected within 10 days. I mean, if we had something like that, uh, that forced normalcy allowed to the extent normalcy can exist under any circumstances, uh, how, how do we do that, Steve? Well, you know, that was the purpose of the CEQA analysis, the environmental analysis that was conducted for the project. So when we analyze the project or when the consultants analyze the project along with staff, they identified significant environmental impacts uh, related to a variety of issues, including um, trans traffic circulation um, in the neighborhood. And from that analysis came a number of mitigation measures. And those mitigation measures are turned into conditions of approval of the project, and they'll stick to the project. If there's any changes to those um, conditions of approval, they have to come back and be dealt with by the city council. But yeah. can we raise mitigation issues 
uh, on our own. If, if people residing in a given area up there point out a, a danger that's affecting them, uh, how do we, they come to us, they please address it. How do we get back to the owners and say, uh, here's a problem, it's got to be solved. We can't have people walking uh, their dogs and their kids in the street and having this happen and that happen, whatever's going on. How, how do we protect ourselves to make, uh, to, to make the owners uh, meet uh, our expectations without technical, is, is, that, is that a comma there or a period without that? Yeah, that's why I think I'm interested in knowing exactly what sort of conditions you want to see that are not already spelled out in the conditions of approval that came from the mitigation measures through the environmental impact report analysis. Well, the the answer is, I, I don't know the answer to that, Steve, but you heard, you heard residents come up and talk about their own particular aspect of uh, danger or concern. And that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, something that is going to be meaningful so that you still walk your kids uh, on the street uh, in areas as compared to sidewalks, if there are any. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you require that? A year. Okay, Dana also. Dana a year, also in let me finish my sentence. Okay. How, okay. Do you, how, how do you require that? if you don't have some legal authority to, for the city to say, you have to change that, you're jeopardizing people walking their dogs, walking their something, whatever. Right, I, you know, I just have to assume that during the environmental analysis pro process, when we received comments to the EIR, that those issues were adequately addressed. Um, it sounds like what the council or some of the council members want to know is specifically what some of these conditions provide. So I would suggest that, you know, for traffic, if the traffic consultant is present, that maybe they can go over those conditions of approval that address some of the concerns that have been raised by the residents with respect think, to- yeah. Steve, I think it's a good idea to try to do that. But Steve, basically what you're saying is in the EIR, it's already in there. And what Dane is saying is, and what I'm looking at is, is it in writing that the people know mm -hmm. that right. we have their best interest at heart? That's all. Right. And, 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 that we can, and that we can correct or be instrumental in getting corrected uh, a particular hazard or problem that the neighborhood feels. Right. And we do that regularly anyway, Dana. We, you we, know, we, we do that as a course of, of operation. We are basically you know, saying mean. we are basically saying that we don't agree with the traffic study and what the findings are as to whether we can change them so that we agree is the question that uh, how do you walk your dog on the street uh, that has a lot of traffic on it? You can't very well shut down the street, so you have to make some sort of findings that make the homeowner a little more safe or feel safer than he does right now, given the current traffic study. And okay, is, Steve, I would, I would also feel comfortable if there was a, a conditional uh, um, use where the hotel stays or the resort stays would be a minimum of three nights or five nights, whatever is decided upon. Mm -hmm. And that if in 18 months or a year, the traffic flow changes and people are no longer staying on the property full time and there is more traffic coming out of the main gate, then perhaps an alternate gate might be used where people like the service gate, people who are guests who do want to leave the property and do want to go shopping or go out for dinner, that they would be required to use an alternate gate. So that main gate wouldn't be a, 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 a gate that was used uh, for come and go traffic. 
So but those are two I, I things risk. that yeah. I think people are concerned with the, the changes that might be occurring and whether or not we can, uh, you know, reevaluate in a year or two, you know, what, what changes might make the neighborhood less safe or more congested. Well, I, I, res, I, I think what you're saying is couldn't be done because you're, you're asking somebody to restrict their business. You can only rent it for three days. You can't do that. I mean, they're, they're spending. Uh, Why not? Why, you, wait a minute. Why not? These are well, that, that'd, be that'd be like saying, that'd be like saying to a restaurant, you can only serve uh, four people in one meal. You know, that's exactly Charlie, right, this, Charlie. It's huh? being presented as a retreat for people who want to go yeah, and make you still, you still and enjoy all the enjoy all the amenities on site for three no, days. You, you, now we find out that it's not just for adults, which I thought it was because most people I know that pay those prices and go for uh, a, a retreat, a health retreat, don't bring their children. I think yes. it's wonderful if they want to bring their children. But I think it's something that now we know about. But no, I think I, no. that, that absolutely, I mean, they, they, we've been hearing that this is um, three and five day stays that these retreat guests yeah. are going to be staying. Let me, so Iris, 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 let me ask you this. Just think logically. When the Ritz Carlton is up there, would you say if you were investing in the Ritz Carlton because it's a two lane street going up to the top of the mountain? However, the Ritz Carlton you build is you can only have people there for three days. It makes Charlie, absolutely no sense. Charlie, the Ritz Carlton is not a retreat, and we're not being sold and onto a Ritz Carlton. We are being it's being presented to us that this is a six star resort, which I believe it will be, and I would love to vote yes on this, and I'm hoping that I can. But I am I have great concerns, just like the residents, that things are going to change. And all of a sudden people can come for one night or for two nights, and there's gonna be more traffic from the airports or from people will be driving their own car if they're staying for one night or two nights. So I think that if this is truly a six star resort that certain certain uh, uh, accommodations can be insisted upon as as part of of our desire to keep this as a true res retreat as opposed to a hotel where people are coming and going you you can't you can't you cannot restrict a retreat or a right. hamburger place or, a, or let me just say this before right. when I start when I started wait a second Charlie, yeah. this, the idea Charlie. was this the idea was just to make sure to make sure that the residents who have spoke at the planning commission and with us here have an opportunity if things get out of hand to come to city council and say, look at this, I need a stop sign here, you should put speed bumps in. That is all I'm saying. And what Isaiah is saying and what Steve is saying, Charlie, it's there, it's written there, it is there. That's what we do. We listen to the people for speed bumps or safety or whatever. That's all I'm saying. Steve, uh, I'm afraid, agree, Charlie. Thank you, Ted. Steve, did, did you wanna say something, Ted? No. Steve, uh, I think it's a little more complex than Charlie's giving it. Um, but what I'm talking about, or trying to talk about, is a clause in the agreement that allows the Rancho Mirage city manager to conduct such inspections of the area surrounding the retreat. And if the city manager or his designee is cons considers a particular situation as to being either hazardous to people inside or outside, uh, to people, people using uh, the streets and sidewalks in the, in the manner in which they're supposed to be used, that the city manager uh, 
after discussing the matter with the, um, the developer, that the city manager can say, can, can issue an edict that this or that shall not be done, may not be done, pursuant, pursuant to the clause in the document X number XYZ. I would be supportive of that if, if, if it were handled on that basis. I think that basically means that the city manager can assure the residents of Charlie's concerns about these, these areas and Richard's that we're listening to them. Yeah. That if it needs a stop sign or if it needs, you know, any sort of mitigation. Whatever uh, it is. The city manager exactly. Would, would be able to inject that and take care of it. If that were the case, I would be supportive of that. Yeah, well, yeah. That, that, would, that would be what I would, after we discuss it, everybody has a chance to say. But what I said, and hopefully the reporter will be able to find it, what I said was, uh, it, in the form of a motion, but also uh, in the form of uh, uh, a contractual relationship with the city and the developer with respect to whatever's in the box of issues that we've raised. So, so these, are saying, yes. Yes. these are all public streets. Yes. These are all public streets. We have all, we have, it's our streets. So Isaiah, oh, for, forgetting saying, that Isaiah, Isaiah, a lot of stuff happens. It's always there, right? Isaiah? These doesn't are, matter if it's our street. What we're talking about is, uh, an agreement yeah, I, I, from them. I, I understand uh, we don't need anybody's authority to go do anything on a public street. In other words, you have it and it's already written into streets and regulations that if anybody comes and complains that staff will look into making changes, period. It's already written in, is it not? Yeah. yeah. So, some form. So without hearing maybe a little bit more specificity on exactly what it is, uh, what scenario it is that the council is concerned with, it would be very difficult for us to have such a broad provision. Uh, obviously, you know, what I've heard is, you know, let's say we have a speeding concern like we've had many on Sahara Road. You know, mm -hmm. there's a process that we follow for those. Ultimately, enforcing speed limits is up to the city. That, that's up to us. We also have some project specific issues, uh, such as the flow uh, of traffic, where construction vehicles can go and where they can't go. And there are punitive measures already built into this. So, you know, some of it, maybe if there's more um, uh, specific examples of where the, the current document is short, um, or what the concern is, and maybe we can point out if that's been addressed or not, or if we need to add it or not. With what I'm hearing right now, um, it, it would be rather hard for us as staff to go back and say, really, what issue was it that the current documents before you did not address? Um, so well, you know, ultimately, these are public streets, and we have full discretion over them. So, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, we have a development agreement here that runs with the land, uh, so they, they, they can't go make changes as they want. Um, you, you know, if, if they want to uh, make a change and it's not consistent with the documents that you have before you today, that restarts a whole process. So do they have to go amend the EIR and study the impacts of that change? So if they wanted to come in and do something, we would say, is that consistent with the original documents and entitlements that were awarded by the city? And when the answer is no, it re-triggers the process. So you, you, you're absolutely right. You cannot guarantee forever uh, that nothing will ever, ever change, but the process is built in so that they have to go back through the decision makers at that point with the proper environmental review and analyzing what are the potential impacts of that change. Right. Okay. okay well, so Isaiah, wait, no, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm, I'm, ahead, I, I'm, I'm responding uh, to Isaiah. Isaiah, all of that is true. We've got all that authority now. I'm not talking about the routine sort of thing necessarily, but what I'm talking about one of the speakers talked about uh, taking his dogs for a walk in 
the dog walks on the street uh, and he had concerns. And there were other specific examples from the people uh, who spoke. What I'm talking about is not something that can be interpreted in the contract as being an existing right. What I'm talking about is where we, the city and the developer, enter into an agreement that if the city brings to them any complaint of the public, or words to this effect anyway, brings a complaint from the public concerning, huh, funny, we never thought about that type of issue, uh, that the, the developer will, in the end, if total agreement cannot be made, uh, will follow the dictates of the city in saying, well, you can't drive down this road uh, for two hours or whatever. Uh, even though it, you may argue that it's already in there, bottom line is it's not in there when great attorneys, and I don't mean good attorneys, I mean great attorneys like they have, uh, uh, when, when they say they start tearing apart the language of uh, uh, that's being un, uh, reviewed, uh, you have to have something in writing that says the city has the authority and they have the authority to meet and work out so work out a resolution. And if you don't get it worked out, they can arbitrate it or something of that nature. Uh, <clears throat> because the issues that these people are raising are, are, are serious and significant issues. Uh, and I will say that uh, when I first came to this issue, I was very much uh, in favor of it. I'm still in favor of it uh, for the city, but not at the expense of the residents. Now, some residents were asking something reasonable, some were asking something unreasonable, but <clears throat> Uh, we have to have an ability to come in and say, no, this was never raised before, but our special committee uh, has, has to take it up if, if it gets assigned to it. And uh, the result of the special committee plus one neutral arbitrator uh, resolves that issue. If you have something like that, then the ongoing issues that uh, the public will have uh, with a, a business of that size uh, as neighbors, then they at least they have a process that they can uh, bet is right or bet is wrong. But I don't think uh, I, I don't think it's wrong for these people to be concerned about the future because none of us can see the future. And I'm 100% in favor of this project going forward, but I'm also 100% in favor of protecting the residents yeah. uh, as to most as to most anything that's unreasonable. Sure, sure. I think, I think and, we all feel that way. And, and I think okay. we all do. Let, let me, and, let me okay. ask this. Is Carly, it the Carly wait, excuse wait, me, wait. can I look at, can we just keep, go back to my concerns? Because I know we're talking a lot about traffic my concerns are protecting the neighborhood. And I didn't see anywhere in this document, nor have I heard that this, there is a guarantee that there will, this, this resort will not be turned into a hotel with one night's stays available next year or the year after. Now, I don't know how to phrase something or introduce it into this document, where we can add more protection to the neighborhood so that they know that it's not going to be turned into a regular hotel because we now we also know that children and families are going to be included. I was never aware of that. And that adds a whole different dimension to a, a retreat, a health retreat. So I want guarantees of some sort where our neighbors are, the neighborhoods are going to be protected, where this is not going to turn into 
a hotel with one night stands in the in the next five years or the next eight years at least they'll have some sort of substance where they can rest assured that this is not going to be a, another hotel in their neighborhood and that's why and, and just another business in their neighborhood with lots of traffic and lots of people and lots of construction going on that's something that i think as a council we it is our obligation to protect the mm -hmm. neighbors in that neighborhood and in every neighborhood in Rancho Mirage. So, so I, 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 I agree with you. Let me just say this. Isn't the city, and Isaiah or Steve can answer this, when it comes to streets and traffic and safety, isn't the city in first position to take care of this if that issue comes to the city? We're saying here that we have no no rules, no regulations to put speed bumps in or watch what's going on. That is incorrect. We are in first position. We don't need anything written here. That's not how I started this. I just merely said that we are aware and that people can come in and make that community know that if there is issues in the future, down the road, whatever, that they can come and that we are there. It's already written. Into yes, that's I know, Charlie, and then you uh, keep going agree. back to the bumps and the stop signs. And I no, think no. bumps and stop signs, we all realize, is part of what the city can do without getting uh, any 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 uh, big time approval because that's already within our jurisdiction. I'm talking about not turning this retreat, this beautiful retreat and beautiful property, a couple hundred acres not turning it into a, a hotel where people can come for one night and now they can bring their families and it is going to be just like every other business and hotel in any other neighborhood. That's just, something that, that nobody wants seems to want to talk about. That's not going to be a problem I mean, in my really view. That's why, why I'm not talking about it. Uh, okay, and I yeah, data is the only you. one that it, we're talking about protecting the neighborhood. And Dana has been very vocal about how he feels that strong as far as protecting these neighbors. I'm talking, but I'm talking about unforeseen events that there's not a code section particularly on it, or maybe somewhat arcane and and still be in existence. But Steve. How would you phrase what I'm suggesting? Yeah, here's, uh, let me just offer you some of my observations from a legal perspective. I know that there's some issues with respect to the operations of the, of the project, and I'll have to defer to staff on that issue, on those issues. But in the development agreement, again, which includes a number of conditions of approval, which also incorporates by reference the preliminary development plan, the specific plan, and all the other land use entitlements that come with conditions of approval, including the mitigation measures that came out of the EIR analysis. They're bound by law to comply with all those mitigation measures, and there's a lot of them. But again, I'll defer to staff on the traffic mitigation measures. Um, but we have built into this development agreement an annual periodic review of the development agreement, or the periodic review of the project, per se. So every year on an annual basis, we present this development agreement to the city council. And at that time, the staff will you know, conduct an analysis to determine whether or not they're complying with all the conditions of approval, all the traffic conditions, you know, whether or not they're changing the type of use or the density or intensity of the uses. So that's done every year and that is presented to the city council. And at that time, the public is invited to come in and comment about how the project's been impacting them personally within their neighborhoods. So there's that, um, you know, that, that section is built in here. It's section 32 called periodic review. We also have built into this development agreement an emergency working group. So in the event we run into issues with respect to traffic safety or with respect to any concerns that the neighbors raise, in connection with the operations of the, of the project, we notify the developer that there are issues. This development agreement nor uh, and all the land use entitlements do not provide the developer with the right to disrupt traffic, to create health hazards or to create traffic safety hazards. Anytime we run into concerns raised by the residents, 
we have the right to even issue citations to the developer. We have the right to uh, commence revocation of their in development entitlements. So we have those rights, we have those enforcement rights in place in the event something unforeseen occurs. And so instead of rushing to court on those issues, the development agreement sets up this emergency working group that requires both the city and the developer to work together on trying to resolve these issues before any litigation is commenced from either party. So we have, you know, so we can address some of these concerns as they come up during the life of this project. The thing to keep in mind too with the development agreement, and I'm not saying this to discount anybody's concerns, you know, because uh, frankly, I'm the attorney. I don't live there. I don't see the traffic go in and out. I just have to rely on the EIR and the analysis that's conducted and make sure that that went through the proper process. And as far as I'm concerned, it has. It's gone through the proper process. Whether or not it's adequately uh, addressed everybody's concerns, I can't say that. But the, develop, the great thing about a development agreement is that it puts an ironclad lock on the intensity, the density, and the type of uses. They cannot convert to any other type of use that's not referenced in the development agreement, that's not represented, um, um, you know, placed in the preliminary development plan or the specific plan. There's lots of different layers of entitlements on this particular project because of the sensitivity of the environment there. Lots of them. But one of the things that staff did do, and which is also required under um, state law, was we reached out to all the responsible agencies and the trustee agencies that are going to be impacted one way or another by this project. Mountains Conservancy, Bighorn Sheep Institute, they dealt with those kind of environmental issues. We, you know, we have a traffic study analysis, a pretty extensive traffic study analysis that was conducted. Um, there was public, there was a public hearing for the planning commission. Now, whether or not there are specific conditions or mitigation measures in there that address any one of your particular concerns, that's something I'll have to defer to the experts, um, the traffic consultant on that side or staff to address those particular issues. But I can reassure you that if there are any health issues that surface, any traffic safety concerns that surface, this not, this anything we have in place right now does not give the developer carte blanche to ignore those. We have remedies available that we could resort to in order to bring them into compliance, protect our the health and safety of our residents. We're well, not going to. Steve, the, an the answer today. is, Steve, we're 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 pretty well safe in the issues that were brought up with traffic, the issues that have brought up by Iris about this building into a uh, uh, Waldorf story and down the road, right? Yeah, I, and I think, that, I think that it might be best for perhaps a representative of the developer to address the issue about, you know, converting into a, um, you know, a traditional hotel, because it's my understanding that this is not a traditional hotel. This sure. is more of a health and wellness retreat. <clears throat> and, um, there's a there's it's a big there's a big distinction between a health and wellness retreat and your traditional hotel. hotel thank you. The, the word hotel exactly. and resort is what I started out with. It is not a hotel. So with that, uh, do we want to go? Okay, back wait a minute. We have people who oh, want to talk. Just, go ahead, Charlie. Just hold hold your pony, Charlie. What? I wanted to just just to clarify that. Um, you're saying that you're talking about the developer, mm -hmm. but when the developer is finished and it turns into it's being run by the operator, you know, is there something that that will protect the neighbors from preventing any kind of changes at that point that will mm -hmm. adversely affect that neighborhood? Now the developer developers, representatives, the developers, operators, and managers are all bound by all the conditions of approval set forth in all the entitlements and the development agreement. If the operator uh, violates any of the provisions or any of the conditions of approval, we can actually go after the operator, the manager, and the developer. 
and the landowner if they all happen to be separate and distinct from one another. Steve, what would be... Okay, okay so nothing, but there's nothing right now that's in this agreement that prevents them from turning it into a one-night stay oh, facility. I, I, I defer to, let me defer to staff on that particular issue since it has to do with an operational issue. Yeah, they're not, they're not going to do that. It just doesn't make sense. But the point that I would like to make is... No, but Mr. Mary said, point Steve, it out where it is in the agreement. I mean, where it is Steve, in the um, development entitlements. Steve, maybe an approach to this could be a catch-all clause that if either side sees a, a condition that they believe should be modified that isn't covered by the contract and related documents. The parties agree to mediate the issue with a mutually selected judge and the, the finding of that judge will be final. Uh, that seems to me it lets, it lets the contract speak for itself. If something comes up that's not in the contract or only arguably in the contract, that we have a process where either side can ask for a hearing between themselves and uh, come to a conclusion. If they don't come to a conclusion, then they can file a lawsuit. Uh, that is what okay. the Emergency Working Group is all about. You know, that really doesn't answer my concerns. And you know, well, wait a second. Uh, wait a second. Before we talk about your concern, concern, before we talk about your concern, we're going to finish talking about my concern. So continue. Okay, with, sounds good. Continue with what okay. you were saying. But why you know, does anything prevent us from entering into? a side agreement with them that if something isn't resolved via the language of the contracts, that the parties agree to mediate uh, that with, a, with a, an acceptable uh, judge or mediated it anyway with a judge. So, you know, currently in, um, I would say in most um, superior courts throughout California, I know in Riverside County, first thing we are required to do is go to mediation. You as a mediator, Mr. Hobart, know that when there's, there's a lot of issues go before they are litigated, they'll call in a mediator or they'll send the parties to mediation. That's, they're doing that. It's pretty much mandatory now that we go to mediation. But how, how about this? How about if uh, we take a little recess and let me discuss this issue with the developers council to see if we can come up with some language that deals with your particular issue, Mr. Mayor. And um, as far as Council Member Smotridge, uh, maybe we can come up with something that addresses your issue, or we can come up with a response that addresses your issue. I want to be able to point out specifically where those where those issues are addressed in the current entitlement. Can we I, I, I think that's a good idea, Steve, because I, you know, I, I do wants, too. Nobody, Let, let's but nobody wants to go you to think court, it's a good idea? go to mediation if something can be included in the original agreement then that will preclude a, a, the need to go to a mediator or to get involved in a court action yeah, no, I guess we could probably tie, some, tie it up on both ends okay thank you I so think, much and thank well, you mr should, mayor we should take a 15 minute break right. and allow you to meet mm -hmm. i beg your pardon Robert, you have my phone number who that's right. Uh, Jim Vaughn. Yes. Jim's right there somewhere. Yes. So Jim, just give, me a, give me a buzz. So, so j just to be clear, obviously, um, you know, there are some provisions that you guys have brought up that probably are in the existing documents, but, you know, sp specifically, they can't just go change things uh, to one of your points, Councilwoman Smartrich, um, not without going through further analysis and uh, modifying their entitlements through planning commission and the city council. Um, the, you know, obviously there's, there's currently nothing about a minimum night stay or kids. Uh, so if it was a desire of the council to 
um, add anything like that, those are the type of things oh. that we would, staff would need to have within your motion uh, of whatever the council decides to do. Yeah, and uh, it, before we recess, um, uh, Jim is here and I'd like to let him speak from the applicant side. Yeah, let's hear from Jim. Just very quickly, thank you. Um, I want to address uh, council members Smotrich's question about the 25 years. I did go back and look, it is 25 years. And uh, I think for these entitlements or for any land use entitlements that a city can grant, a 25 year development agreement locking in the requirements that the, both the developer and the operator will be held to is as close as you can get to a guarantee. Um, with respect to the traffic, I think it's really important to separate traffic counts and the number of trips we're talking about, because that's been studied ad nauseum, and th there are not very many trips. It's, I think, a maximum projected, and again, this is if it were a hotel, not a retreat. If it were a hotel, it would generate 84 trips a day on Dunes View, which even in the very busiest hour of the day is less than one car going one direction every five minutes. So we're not talking about major traffic impacts. What we're talking about is neighborhood concerns about traffic safety. And we want to address that. It's, it's an existing concern. There aren't sidewalks in every street. There aren't stop signs at every corner. We want to suggest a term be added to the development agreement that the developer will contribute up to $50,000 to pay for and address these traffic concerns of the community their current concerns. It's not about the project, it's about the neighborhood. So we want to contribute that to a traffic study, not traffic study, excuse me, a traffic safety analysis at whatever time the city determines is the right time to do it. Is it this year? Is it the third year of operations? Whenever the city desire, desires to do that, we want to support that. Kind of putting our money where our mouth is, we want to be a good neighbor to this community and we want, if there are traffic safety issues, we'll come in with them to the city council to raise them and address them. And to Steve's point about mediation, that is what we have a provision in the agreement that calls for an emergency working group meeting if either side, either party, believes there's a problem. And that's what it's for. It's not to require mediation, it's to solve problems cooperatively and collaboratively long before you get to a dispute and long before you have to go to court or mediation. We want this to be a success for the community. So that's my suggestion for the development agreement. If uh, that does not fully address the city council members' uh, concerns about adding terms, um, I guess I'd like to hear a little more direction and then I can talk to Steve about that. But I'm hoping that those two factors together address what's been raised. And then Jim, if state a, um, if you would, Jim, state, state a proposed clause that would <clears throat> some years down the road uh, be used to resolve uh, a dispute of some sort between the, the enterprise and uh, one or more residents uh, that's not otherwise expressly covered by uh, the signed documents. That's a, a little bit of a challenging question because obviously the contract is between the city and the, the applicant. Um, but I, I think the, the fact that there is the annual review and maybe we could add some language to the annual review to make it crystal clear that that is an opportunity for the city council to hear and consider any concerns of the adjacent uh, neighbors that haven't been resolved already just directly between the operator the developer and the neighbors. We're hoping you never have to hear from us. We're hoping that so we. once, although there are concerns and fears, we're hoping that once we get this going, the neighbors are gonna be pleasantly surprised that we are gonna be a good neighbor and we are gonna address their issues. So you're saying we can have such a clause that- uh, I, I think we could add forward. like, sorry. We, I'm my, sorry. My, my suggestion was that we add some language to the, the provision that's already there in, in quite a bit of detail about the annual review process to make sure that the project is in compliance. I think we could add language clarifying for the benefit of the public that that is uh, intended to address any unresolved issues that may arise 
uh, with project operations or construction. Yeah. And I'm currently I'm going to get well, pro time. with projects or construction or any time thereafter, huh? Yes, uh, uh, construction or operations. Agreed. Yeah. Oh, construction. That works. Yeah. So I think that I think that's fine. I think that makes a major a major difference, so that people can be heard through the council and uh, move forward. So we can add those two provisions um, if the council desires to act uh, today, uh, which is certainly our desire. Um, between now and the second reading, we can work with the city attorney's office and city staff to add those two provisions so they'll be in your, in your packet before the second reading. Okay, so that, but none of those, none of those provisions that would be added would deal with the, um, the, the property not being in, turned into a hotel. It would remain as a retreat and would be used as a retreat as, as opposed to a one-night hotel. So I hear your concern on is that. There, or is that, is that. Is that impossible to, to incorporate? It is impossible to incorporate a provision that restricts the operations to, to prohibit a one night stay. It's just hard enough to operate a hospitality yeah. business today. I, I suspect the okay. council is well aware that, of that. So that's the, okay, so for me, that's the bottom line, that this facility can be turned into a one night hotel. Thank you very much. I'm glad you clarified that. I don't so, think he clarified that. I think you clarified, clarified it. Uh, to well, it sounds it. like he said yeah. there, he, they but, cannot incorporate it into the agreement where that's, this. That's probably a good thing. Uh, let's go back. We take a break, Steve. Sure. You, you two work, work that out what, where we left off. Okay. And in five or 10 minutes, we come back. Shouldn't take you long. Jim, how long is that going to take you, you to put in a, a little bit of authority for the city to, to, get, to get subsequent issues resolved? Thanks. I got it. All right. Can we take a, take, we can take a break? Jim, I will. Um, Ten minute break. Steve, is this something? Steve, is this something that you guys can work out? Um, yes, between I, this meeting and the next meeting for second reading? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm confident we can do it now. All right, Steve, All right. do it, Steve. I, we have the basis here. Oh, yeah, this go for it. Steve. Let me, let's, do, let's give it a try, Jim. There you go. So, Mayor, we're taking a 10 or 15 minute recess. Okay, so adjourned, uh, not adjourned, <laughs> recess. 15 Wait. minutes? All right. Yes. 15 Thank minutes. You. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mayor, uh, we are all here and ready to uh, resume the meeting when you are. Okay, well, I'm here and ready to resume. Is everybody else ready to resume? We're Looks like ready. we're all ready. Yeah, we're ready. Steve, the all floor ready. is yours. Mr. Mayor, so I had an opportunity to discuss the issues with Mr. Vaughn. He's the attorney representing the developer. And just for the record, no council members were present during that discussion. I blocked everybody off of my screen and I got out of Zoom and I talked to Mr. Vaughn by phone. And here's the um, language we came up with. And it's important to note that since we are doing a development agreement, that it's critical that both sides agree to this language. So that's why it was, it was important for me to discuss this with Mr. Vaughn and have him sign off on it as well. And here's the language we came up with. It's very simple. So in section 32 of the development agreement, it's entitled periodic review. And so we agreed to amend this provision to read as follows. And, and I'll, I'll read through it and then I'll show you uh, what we're adding. So it currently reads section 32 periodic review. The city shall conduct a review of this agreement, that's the development agreement, as set forth as follows. A, annual review. The city will review the extent of good faith compliance by developer with the terms of this agreement annually, commencing on the first anniversary of the effective date of this agreement. And here is the language that we are going to add. 
including to address any unanticipated traffic safety concerns raised by residents in the Magnesia Falls neighborhood. We're also going to add as a condition of approval in the land use entitlements, the following. Within, within 30 days following the effective date of the development agreement, developer shall deposit $50,000 with the city to fund a study or to remediate any traffic safety concerns of the residents of the Magnesia Falls Cove as a city manager or designee deems necessary. So I believe that those, I hope those are sufficient to address the concerns raised by the council members who wanted this issue addressed. So this provides assurances that if there are any issues raised with respect to traffic safety concerns by the residents of Magnesia Falls Cove, we have a mechanism for addressing these issues and yeah, money to address the issues as well. Steve, Steve uh, that, that covers some of the stuff, but one of the things that I commented on half a dozen times or more is if a, a local resident or a resident within 100 yards or 200 yards or something like that of the, of the project um, has uh, an issue or a complaint uh, involved, which involves the project, uh, that, sh that complaint shall be uh, medi mediated uh, or otherwise, or should be re resolved by them mutually or Oh, uh, Mr. Hobart, so the way that it's structured now with this amended language, if there is a complaint by any resident within the Magnesia Falls Cove neighborhood, <clears throat> they would contact the city manager or contact anyone in the city, eventually gets the city manager. Reread re 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 the first sentence or two sentences. Hang on. Hang on, it's got a maneuver here. Okay, so th this is a periodic review. Oh, within 30 days following the effective date of the d development agreement, developers shall deposit $50,000 city to fund a study or to remediate any traffic safety concerns of the residents of the Magnesia Falls Cove as a city manager or designee deems necessary. I mean, that there, that if there's, that's okay. they go to the city manager. That, 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 that's fine so far as it goes. How, what, what are we doing now uh, about the relationship between individual owners and the uh, company? Well, the city, the city is the party to the development agreement. We, are also, we also have um, enforcement authority and the city represents the residents. So the contract is between the city and the developer with the city representing the residents. So- Which clause says that? Our duty to represent the residents or your duty to represent the residents. So if there's any complaints, they would go to, um, you know, either code enforcement or planning or the city manager. This provides a mechanism for the city via the city manager or his designee to address the issue with the developer. And if there's, you know, so, so when the city manager brings this issue up to the developer, we deal with it directly with the developer. If there's an impasse reach, we go to the emergency, we activate the emergency working group. Which, which is what again? The emergency working group involves both representatives of the developer and representatives of the city to meet, basically to meet and confer and to try to mediate the situation before we even go to court and go through formal mediation. So we have that emergency working group that's already built into the development agreement. So you would have an informal mediation on the issue, could be followed by uh, a lawsuit. I beg your pardon. A lawsuit. Yeah, could be that would give them grounds for a lawsuit either side if they didn't like the decision. Uh, and who who would be making that decision? It would be the city manager. City manager or this. City manager would be making yes the but, decision for the city. Yeah, but keep in mind we also have an annual re the, the annual review process set up, which involves the city council. 
Ted, I see you standing. Are you, you see something here? No, not at this point. So good. The, bo the, good. Bottom, the bottom line, it'll go, it'll go to me in the event, in the event the parties can't come to an agreement on this, uh, whether they're making too much noise for their dog or whatever the issue might be, uh, they will go to mediation. No, they don't go to mediation. They try to work it out between the traffic segment of the city and the company. Emergency working group, which consists yep. of the city and representatives of the developer. This is more, this is a really a belt and suspenders approach to resolving disputes over traffic safety concerns. So if any of the residents have any traffic safety concerns, they report it to the city. That get, immediately gets reported to the city manager. The city manager has the, uh, the uh, there's a mechanism built into this development agreement that allows him to reach out to the developer and let the developer know, or the operator or the manager know, that we have a traffic safety concern issue here. We have money sitting, $50,000 sitting on the side that is can be used at the discretion of the city manager to either study the issue and or to actually um, abate the issue. Is and on top of that, we have annual review. So if the annual review, when the annual review comes up, if any of the council members here from any of your constituents who live in the Magnesia Falls Cove, you can bring that to the attention of staff in the context of that annual review, or you can report it directly to the city manager. All, all of that works fine. The, the, tra the traffic, uh, uh, what's he called? What'd you call him? Traffic safety. Traffic safety. Traffic safety. Um, how, how does the represent, how does the individual who lives in the city uh, get past Get past the, meet, the, the the decision of the uh, city manager. They, does that person have the authority to, to somehow get a mediation? Uh, so, so typically a resident goes to a council member first, and then you uh, give it to staff. So that's how they get around me: is they uh, go to the elected official. Well, that's okay. That works fine, and then. The, the the staff member tries to resolve the matter in talking to the other side. Uh, they can't get resolution, we'll say. Uh, what is the, the next step that the owner of, of the dogs uh, has available? Is, is that where he makes a, does he make a demand or a request for mediation? Uh, or does it, does he ask the city manager and the city manager makes the decision whether or not there will be mediation on that point? The city manager has broad discretion here to determine how to resolve the issue. The developer is obligated to respond. They can't ignore it. And we'll have $50,000 of, it's actually going to be our money by the time they deposit it, meaning ours, meaning the city, for the purpose of addressing any of those traffic safety concerns that are raised by the residents. You keep saying tra traffic safety. You said traffic safety or other concerns. That would be okay, but hey, that's... I, but I'm thinking about the guy with the dogs. The dogs are threatened, and the, the man who lives on the corner is, is worried about it. How that brought up in the context of a traffic safety concern, even if cars aren't part of the dog at night. Yeah, that was a traffic safety concern. That's what it was. It was brought up in that context. So, Steve, would this be added to any part of the request for recommendations or what? Yes, it's, you know, so what I would suggest is that if, you know, if, if you make a motion and you want to include these, then the motion should include and um, the, the text that was provided by the city attorney. Mm -hmm. And I can read it into the record again. All right. All right, and where are we all with everybody? Okay. Right, right now we're working it through and 
If anybody sees something objectionable in that, now question. would be a good time to. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Uh, question regarding the committee that will be put together between the developer and the city uh, employee. Could we add uh, a two or one or two people from Mag Falls to bring them together and resolving the issue? Yeah, I, I don't. I think that would end up creating a lot, lot more problems uh, for them. Yes. I mean, if somebody is pursuing, if I'm defending you, you don't need Mr. Y to come and say whether or not I'm defending you or defending you properly. Uh, I okay. wouldn't. Uh, I think that would be encumbering it too much and go toward killing it. I agree. I agree, Dana. Iris, what do you got to say? Well, the only other issue I want to address, and um, so this issue came up, Mr. Vaughn brought this issue up, and it has to do with the, um, the description of the project. Again, you know, the development agreement, the specific plan, the preliminary development plan, our zoning, the general plan, all describe basically what this project is all about. And so section four of the development agreement defines the project um, as well as, as a um, exclusive world-class retreat with a total of up to 50 studio one bedroom and multi-bedroom keys. And it's a basically it's a proposed upgrades that are going to include a modified main house, a new restaurant and dining deck, an upgraded spa complex, additional casitas and villas, upgraded and additional wellness and retreat related amenities and facilities, and a rerouted 18 hole golf course. That's what it is. Right. That's what it is now. Right. That's what it is. Well, it's it's what it's going to be. Going uh, to be. Yeah. They do. Well, there's enhancements to it so it's not this does not describe a run-of-the-mill hotel and when you and the specific plan also has a description of what the project is the environmental impact report has a description of what the project is all the mitigation measures that are tied to this project are tied to a wealth and wellness wealth and wealth and uh, Health. Well, the well, this uh, well, this well, this retreat. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied off my side. Good, good oh, job, Richard. Say, say it once more so I'll understand. Not a Freudian slip. Yeah. So, say it again. I don't know where you were. Otherwise, if this was a hotel, we would just say it's a hotel. Right. But it's not. Yeah. But it's not. It's more than that. Is that what you're saying? I don't know if it's more than that. I think it's less than that. Um, also welfare. <laughs> I would be comfortable with with the motion with the the additional language added. And so the additional language for the record uh, within 30 days following the effective day date of the development agreement developer shall deposit $50,000 with the city to fund or to fund a study or to remediate any traffic safety concerns of the residents of the Magnesia Falls Cove as the city manager or designate deems necessary. That is, that, is that 50,000 going to be sufficient? You're not asking me. Right. How about uh, I think if, if that fund is exhausted, an additional 50,000 will be added. I said that's fine. We're, 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 we're building on this more and more. That's fine. Thank you. So, Steve, can you read yeah, it great. with uh, the mayor's amendment? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, so 50,000. Okay. As a city manager or designee deems necessary, including replenishing the $50,000 if necessary. One time. Fine. One time. Uh, if, if uh, the Jim is requesting if you can add the word one time, so a one time replenishment, including replenish, uh, well, I, one time replenishment. Who, who, who's asking for that? 
the developer's attorney. This this has to be agreed upon. We can't force this. Yeah, well, on. I know. I, you absolutely has to be agreed upon. But, but Jim, I, Jim, I don't, I don't see where your risk is all that big that there will be more than one or there will even be one because you, uh, but. Uh, he's agreeing to there not to be a fine is got how, how else do you punish a uh, he's he, he's agreeing to your amendment mr mayor he's agreeing to it well i unfortunately can't hear it so okay okay so read it, read it please steve yeah including a one-time replenishment of three thousand dollars as may be requested by the city manager or designee okay yeah, it's one time all right, are we ready? And yeah, and then just for the record, so we're gonna amend section 32 periodic review to add the following language, including to address any unanticipated traffic safety concerns raised by residents in the Magnesia Falls neighborhood. That's in the context of the periodic review. So we bring the periodic review to the city council on an annual basis if there's any concerns, traffic safety concerns raised by the residents during that year, we will bring that to the attention of the city council. Well, and, but what, why not add, I mean, hopefully this is gonna be there for a long time, uh, a one year penalty, uh, it should be, it should be up the 50,000 or whatever it is, should be there at all times. Uh, for, to cover uh, bad behavior or an accidental behavior or whatever it is. We have the ability, we have something even more, um, we have a bigger um, gun in our pocket. We could revoke the permit. So if they are, if they're being, if they're being very egregious with, uh, with ignoring the traffic safety concerns of the residents and creating a, any kind of health and safety issue, we have the legal authority to either uh, revoke the development agreement or we can commence proceedings to revoke their entitlements, which come with fines, which come with the payment of attorney's fees. But there's only one fine one time, isn't there? No. no. Well, you can find every day. Every day is okay. a, a separate offense. Oh, okay. Every single day. <clears throat> and we've used that in some instances. Every day for the existence of the agreement. Every day they violate. Right. And the agreement is in force. In the agreement. We have a number of other remedies available that are set forth in our ministry. Yeah, I'm sure we do, and I'm sure that nobody really wants or expects that we'll ever resort to any of this. But the bottom line is the people who are closest to being offended by something going on over there, uh, they're the ones who are trying to protect. Yes, and I think yes. in traditional language, you're doing that. Okay. You, so something, a complaint by... A valid complaint by a local resident uh, would not have a statute of limitations, uh, probably, at least not between us, uh, and uh, would have a, an ability to recover damages up to $50,000. It's not damages. It's or what word would you use? It's a fund that's created to either study or to remediate the concern. Okay, to remediate, yeah. that works. Okay, legal fees. Okay. All right. Each, each side to bear his own. Yes, unless there's litigation, the prevailing party pays. The prevailing party gets their legal fees paid. Yeah, but we're, and, and, we're not. But we're not there. We're we're not. This is all prior. The, the whole purpose of these provisions is to avoid litigation. To avoid that. Right. That's that's why I didn't include that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Iris, what do you see? Well, uh, I, I, I would just like to state that um, I think this has been an incredibly educational discussion. 
Uh, and just to reiterate, and maybe if somebody, if I'm incorrect on some of these things, maybe somebody can tell me, because now at Build Out, we're going to have 188 guests. We're going to have 105 employees, which is 293. We are going to have now families, and uh, there's going to be extra charges for things, other amenities like maybe yoga or nutritional classes or playing golf or tennis. So what I had always thought of and what I looked at in this project as being as a, an all-inclusive retreat where all these things would be in most of the retreats I've ever been familiar with, everything is included. It's a, a one-stop inclusive of everything. But now you have children who are also going to be included. And if mom wants to go to the spa and dad wants to go play golf, now are we going to, they're going to bring in counselors to watch over the children or are the children just going to be on their own? And no, they're, um, they're going to be, they're so going to be on. It, 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 so then it turns into something other than the six star re retreat that I was under the impression that this was going to be. So if I'm incorrect, maybe somebody could tell me because this has been a real education for okay. me. I had no idea it was going okay, to be. Can I ever say you got to? I think you're incorrect. I think the children issue is irrelevant. I think we have to solve the basic problem that we've been talking about that Steve and Jim uh, put together. Uh, well, that's okay. I, that's, and that seems to be Wait. solved already. That's not a problem. Okay. And, 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 and I, it was my and, understanding and you, that that would yes. always be taken care of. And uh, with respect to children and this and this, and whether it's called an apartment or hotel or something else, there's been nobody else that has expressed that of you. Consequently, that subject is now out of the way because there's not a, I mean, there's not somebody saying, well, I want to add something to your position. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, let me, um, uh, Charlie, anything further from you? No, no, I, I think we have all, you know, exhausted it. And I will, let me just say this. I think it's a wonderful thing of this conversation because it's got to show that we are as, as intent of listening to the people and the residents of Ranch Mirage. And if anything has ever shown that it has been this conversation, this subject, and this problem. Thank you. Ted? No, I think you've covered it. And Richard? I agree with Charlie. But I don't think we should get bogged down in the minutia. I couldn't agree more, and I don't think we're in the minutia with what we've got on the table. Good. Agree. You handled it well, Dana. Okay. Um, all those in favor of adding... Oh, no, we need, we need to do a motion first. You have to make a motion. Okay. So I, I will make the motion if that's all right with everybody. Chad, is that okay? You? You might, you look, you might work, work, work for Steve in getting it out. I, I, I certainly will when I get to the end of it. All right, here I go. <laughs> That the City Council A adopt resolution number 2021 next in order, approving and adopting the proposed mitigation, moderating, and reporting program for the Porcupine Creek Re Creek project, and approving the certifying the final environmental impact report for the Porcupine Creek Retreat Project B. Introduce ordinance number next in order, first reading, approving the proposed statutory development agreement by and between the City of Ranch Mirage and Porcupine Properties, LLC. C, introducing ordinance number next in order, first reading, approving the proposed general plan zoning map amendment for the Porcupine Creek Retreat Project. D, Introducing ordinance number next in order, first reading, approving the proposed specific plan for the Porcupine Creek Retreat Project and E. Adopt resolution number 2021 next in order, approving the proposed preliminary development plan permit for the Porcupine Creek Retreat Project 
and Steve? Or as amended? As amended. You're on mute, Steve. I second the motion. Steve, okay. do you see any problems with this? No. We're good? Yeah. With the and amendment, Richard, you second it? Yeah. I second the motion. You seconded the motion. Okay. No further discussion. No. Uh, Christy, will you please let's, take let's a have a let's have our uh, um, uh, city clerk uh, take a roll call vote here. Council Member Kite, yes. Council Member Smotrich, no. Council Member Townsend, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil, yes. Mayor Hobart, yes. Motion carries four one with Council Member Smotrich opposed. Okay, where are we now? Somebody tell me. All right, uh, we will now move on to our action calendar. So we will move on to agenda item number 12. Uh, this is ordinance number next in order, first reading amending chapter 9.68 of title nine of the Ranch Mirage Municipal Code to regulate the use of weapons. And Jeremy Gleim, our development services director is gonna handle this presentation. Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Hageman. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'll keep this one brief. Uh, the, the ordinance before you today simply amends uh, a chapter of the Municipal Code uh, eliminating the use of firearms as a depredation um, activity in the city of Rancho Mirage. So that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. So, so uh, this is the uh, coot shoot issue, correct? That's correct. Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, before we go to the can I was just going to say, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. On behalf of Coots Everywhere, I look forward <laughs> to thanking the council and to uh, voting in favor of the motion. So be before we return this to the council, let's go ahead and open up the public comment period on this item. So if uh, any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are <laughs> participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom. Uh, if you're participating by telephone, you would hit star nine to indicate that you would like to make a public comment at this time. Uh, before we go to our remote audience, do we have any speaker cards? Yes, we have one, Tanya Petrova. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council everywhere. Um, I'm Tanya Petrovna, and I would encourage you to please um, do eliminate the use of firearms for the wildlife depredation. I really enjoy speaking to the public usually. I, I don't mind groups, but I'm, again, still, I, I get shaken up now because I, I, I just, I'm shaken up by the experience because I was one there and having a gun um, inches from my face when I was just trying to talk to someone, not understanding why. They were shooting birds, watching the birds fall from the sky, watching the struggling birds in the water. I just... And, and that it happens all the time. I mean, I, I know that's been happening for years, and I really thought years ago it had ended. I, you know, I'm from the Valley. I've worked, you know, as a youngster at the Annenberg Estate, um, Thunderbird Country Club, you know, El Dorado, where my father was a maitre d' for so many years. And, you know, we heard of this, and, and we used to write letters, and so much time has passed, and I, I wasn't, I really didn't think it still continued. And I was, I was shocked. And again, the experience that I relive is, is not good, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone ever again. And I just think from the playground of presidents, what, what Rancho Mirage was known for, to have these wild hunts with men with guns that have no, that wouldn't care to come within inches from you. I mean, one gentleman held his hand up to me as to hit me when I walked to him, and I, I, I just, I'm still in shock. And if you can eliminate this from happening ever again to anyone, to anyone's children having to witness all these birds being shot, and this is wildlife. This isn't something that's endangering someone's life. This is just endangering someone's shoes, you know? So please, please have some compassion, and let's stand up now and, and 
please help Rancho Mirage regain its image of playground of the presidents and, and something a little more classier than, you know, shooting ducks and not having the coots and not having a problem with anyone standing in their way and even shooting inches from them. That's, that's just crazy. Um, we would, thank we would you. like to thank you very much for bringing this matter to our attention. It was extremely late in getting to uh, our agenda. Uh, still, we're probably the only city in anywhere around that's got it in the agenda, or there aren't many. Uh, we just thank you very much. Yes. Some cities do have us. some cities do have the in their laws, and so I would hope, like Indian Wells does. So please mm -hmm. follow suit and let's do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else in, here in person that would like to make a comment on this item? Okay, seeing no one here in person, we'll go to our remote audience. Bettina Ross Marino. Hi again, council members and mayor. Um, thank you for proposing this amendment to your weapons ordinance to disallow the shoots in the city limits of Rancho Mirage. My name is Bettina Rose Marino, and I'm the founder of Palm Springs Wildlife Advocates, and we provide wildlife advice and services to all of Coachella Valley. And I wanted to make sure you all know that myself and my groups of which I'm a part are so very grateful for this opportunity to protect Coachella Valley wildlife. Many of us spoke and wrote to you a couple weeks ago about the American coot shoots that took place at the S Resort, and we appreciate you taking the time to hear us and for your quick response to address the situation. In speaking with Council Member Smotrich, we will be researching the most effective non-lethal mitigation methods and then providing that information to you. We will be conferring with bird experts, biologists, and other golf courses to determine what they all recommend. We then will draft those methods into a document that we can share with, your, with yourselves and staff. And I'm confident we can come up with an efficacious program by discussing with experts. I'm so happy about this new amendment. And I hope you all realize how necessary this is, both from a safety issue and a need to protect our environment and wildlife. Even our old coots like Mayor Hobart. Thank you for your time. Please feel free to reach out at your convenience. Uh -huh. I also would like to somebody um, somebody give me a gun. I want to shoot that coot. <laughs> um, I also wanted to make a statement from Jane Garrison, who is the president of Oswald Land Trust. She could not. She was on the call for several hours uh, and could not continue to stay on the call. But she wanted to say that she really appreciates uh, your speedy response to this uh, and for protecting wildlife. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Nancy French. Hi there, my name is Nancy French. Thank you, Rancho Mirage City Council. I'm a volunteer with Palm Springs Animal Shelter and Animal Samaritans and a homeowner in the Cathedral City Cove on the border of Rancho Mirage. I'm also here in support of agenda item 12 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code to regulate the use of weapons and eliminate the use of firearms for wildlife depredation activities. As I stated at the last meeting, unsupervised gun use is highly dangerous. The bullets drop somewhere and pose a danger to the citizens and visitors of Rancho Mirage who are enjoying hikes and other outdoor activities nearby. The shoots also normalize gun use in public with very little oversight, which is setting a really poor, unsafe example for such a beautiful town. And most importantly, this interferes with the wildlife that is vital to the local ecosystem and is actually an attraction enjoyed by a majority of the citizens and those of us who work so hard to preserve and encourage these animals to be part of our neighborhood. So thank you so much for your time and compassion. Thank you for your time. Thank comment. you. Next speaker is Brad Hirsch. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Brad Hirsch. I'm a homeowner of Rancho Mirage. I'm very much in favor of the resolution. I like to say I'm very proud of the city and the council people for doing the right thing. Thank you again for standing up for the wildlife. Thank you for your comment. 
Um, seeing no one else that wishes to speak on this item, we will close the public comment period and I'll turn this over to the council. Well, what do you have as our next on the agenda? Um, so this would take an action by the city council. So we would need a motion if there's no questions of staff. Okay. I'll be happy to make a motion, Mr. Mayor. Please Mr. Do. Mayor, before, Mr. Ma okay. Go ahead. Wait a second. It's, go ahead, uh, Iris. I would, I would, I would just like to give a little bit of an update because uh, I contacted the eleven speakers who spoke at our last council meeting regarding the coot shooting issue, and I also included an additional speaker. And I received thank you, several thank you messages, and did have a conference call with two of the speakers. And our conversation was very fruitful and they are going to contact Joe Gill from the S Club to have further discussions. I then phoned someone who was recommended, uh, Jason and Ken Mipnuck, and they are from a company called Winged Solutions. Uh, it's a falconer system. And for some people who may not be familiar with it, it's three generations of family owned uh, a company and located in Palm Desert and they do a lot of mitigation and their accounts included uh, Indian Wells, the JW Marriott, Palm Desert Community Park and a very variety of soccer fields. And they even uh, mitigated the Raven, Raven issue for the living desert. And they specialize in waterfowl mitigation and use three different methods of operation that I thought people might be interested in, especially if they're not familiar with it. Uh, they use number one, free flying hawks then, that are well trained. They land on the ground, they fly into trees, they swoop down where needed, and then they fly back to the handler. Uh, the birds react to a predator on the property and they'll fly away. Uh, the coots are a little bit slow to lift off, so they run into the water and find hiding places. Uh, they also bring a dog uh, who runs around the basic uh, the property and basically provides the same results. And some birds fly away, some coots run into the water or finding find hiding places. And then the third method they use is using a radio controlled boat, which is about a foot long. It floats around in the water to scare off the birds, and it's used by itself. Uh, when it's used uh, is really not as effective. So it needs to be used in conjunction with a dog and falcons or hawks. And um, they can be used at night, uh, the, the dog and the boat. And Palm Desert Park has uses their services three times per week uh, for one hour each time and it's $60 per hour. And to be effective, they have to do it uh, repetitiously. So. This is something that where a problem doesn't go away so fast, but the mediation, if it is started at the beginning of the season, can be about 65% effective. So that was something I wanted to just bring everybody up to date with. And uh, I also wanted to mention, and several people have concerns about um, public health and the birds with the bird droppings. And this is a problem that was even mentioned by the mitigation company. Um, I won't go into detail. You can always look online to get information because birds and the bird droppings do contain parasites and there are a number of diseases associated with the bird droppings. So people, at least if they're aware of it, can be more careful where they're stepping. Uh, the birds are an incredible and intricate part of our lives and we really enjoy their beauty. Uh, they're an incredible ecology um, element in our on our whole ecology system and they are they make incredible contributions to our system uh, unfortunately because they do uh, have problems with their droppings people are concerned about uh, carrying these uh, uh, remnants into their cars and into their homes so I'm so so glad that this was brought to our attention so we could at least uh, provide some kind of uh, remediation for, for, and mitigation for some of the facilities that may be having a, a food problem or a bird problem. But I particularly wanted to thank Randy and Bettina 
for our conference call, mm -hmm. and I wanted to thank them especially for their input because uh, this is something that we all want to be mindful of and treat the situation in a very humane manner. So I'm glad that we have it on our agenda today. Thank you so much. All right, all right Mayor. Mayor. Oh, oh, Richard, were you going to end up? I was going to continue the most. I just had a question of Iris. You mentioned Palm Desert Park charges $60. What was the process there? Well, they use all three processes. They use the flying uh, hawks. They use the uh, radio control boats in the water, and they also use uh, dogs. And uh, it's $60 an hour. And right now, Palm Desert Park has them three times a week for three an hour each time. So it's something that where the, the, the battle is ongoing according to the gentleman who owns this company. And uh, you have to start whatever mitigation you're going to bring in uh, early in the season because once these birds get established and they make their nests and they find hiding places, uh, it's very hard to uh, fight that battle. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. That it? Um, That's it for me. All right. I'll make the motion that the City Council introduce ordinance number next in order. First reading, amending Charter 9.68, Weapons of Title IX, Public Peace, Morals, and Welfare of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code to regulate the use of weapons. Second, the motion. We can call this the old coots motion. <laughs> All right, we I love them. that, Richard. There's too much truth to that, Richard. Oh, Richard, <laughs> Richard. We have a motion and a second. Christy, please take the vote. Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Absolutely. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. We will now move on to uh, agenda item number 13, which is resolution number 2021, next in order, adopting a citywide infrastructure investment policy. And Jesse Eckenroth, our director of public works, will handle this presentation. Jesse. Thank you, Mr. Hagerman. I will try to keep this as brief as Jeremy's, but I don't think I'll be able to hit the 15 second mark. I might surpass that. Uh, but to begin, Mayor and Council members, the city of Rancho Mirage has an excellent repu reputation for its infrastructure and facilities, which is evidenced by the lack of electrical lines, thanks to major utility undergrounding projects, by the well-maintained roadway system, the comprehensive sidewalk infrastructure, thoughtful traffic signal operations, and on and on. There is no question that infrastructure projects are supported by the city. And today's staff report and resolution are simply formalizing the city's stance on supporting infrastructure. Based on the current state of the city being substantially built out, the city is well poised to connect and make complete many infrastructure elements within the city, such as sidewalk gaps. This resolution is not seeking approval of a project, nor is it obligating the city to any future project. It is simply formalizing the city's stance on supporting infrastructure. As city staff identify infrastructure gaps that, if completed, could improve the quality of life, improve safety, and or promote economic development, city staff will then submit those individual projects to council for consideration on a case-by-case -case basis at that time. This resolution will support the goals and objectives of the general plan and will be used as a guide for staff when considering projects. This concludes my prepared summary, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we'll now open up the public comment on this item. If any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom or star nine on your telephone. Is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, uh, let's go to our remote audience. And again, if you wanted to speak on this item, you would hit the raise hand button or star nine on your telephone. 
Okay, seeing no one that wishes to speak on this item, we will close the public comment period and I will turn this over to the council. Yes, Steve, this is Charlie. I have a question. Does next in order 2021 have anything to do with the bridge? <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it, Jesse. I'm sorry. No, sir. Charlie, Charlie, yeah. just for yes, you, Rich. I will move for the council resolution number 20 21, next in order for the bridge, right, Charlie? Yes. Adopting a citywide infrastructure improvement policy. And I'll okay. second it, Richard. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christy, will you please take the vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smarich? You're on mute, Council Member. Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. We will now move on to uh, item number 14 on our agenda. Uh, which is resolution number 2021 next in order authorizing the issuance of uh, not to exceed 7 million in principal amount of city of Rancho Mirage community facilities district bonds number four B the Dell web project and Kofi Antebaum our director of administrative services will be handling this presentation Kofi thank you Mr. Hegeman um, good afternoon mayor and council mm -hmm. members on September 5th, 2019, the council adopted resolution number 2019-44, establishing community facilities district number 4B, the Delaware project, and providing for the levy of special taxes to finance the acquisition and construction of certain public facilities within the district. The city council also adopted resolution number 2019-45, deeming it necessary to incur bonded debt to finance such public facilities. This action before you today is to approve the issuance of CFD number 4B special tax bonds series 2, 2021A to reimburse the costs of public improvements and public facilities fees paid by the developer and fund bond issuance costs. The proposed bond size is not to exceed 7 million with interest rates between 3.5 and 4% for 30 years. The bonds will be sold the week of April 12 and expected to close by the end of April. These bonds are not city debt. The city has no obligation to pay debt service in the event of a default or non-payment by property owners. The pledged revenue for the repayment of these bonds are special taxes paid by property owners within CFD4B, which ranges from approximately $800 to $1,723 annually, based on the square footage of each property. Notices of this special tax is provided to property owners and adequately disclosed when purchasing their homes. Homeowners also have the option of prepaying the special tax. Special taxes um, will be levied on these on the parcels within CFD4B um, annually to pay for debt service and admin administrati administration costs. Approximately 91% of the assessments will come from mm -hmm. homes that have already been sold or in escrow, and the developer will cover be responsible for the remaining um, homes that are yet to be sold. The city's CFD administrator will be responsible for annual calculation of the special taxes necessary to pay debt service and administration costs and place that on the county tax roll to ensure that debt service payments are made. Staff recommends that the city council approve the attached resolution authorizing the issuance of the bonds and execution of related documents. With us today um, is Kurt DeCrenis, um, the city's financial advisor and representatives from Bond Council, Weldon Financial Services, and Paul T, the developer. They are all on Zoom. And that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you um, council may have. Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. 
Uh, let's go ahead and open up the public comment period. Uh, if any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are participating remotely on Zoom, you would hit the raise hand button, or if you're on your telephone, you would hit star nine now to make a public comment on this item. Uh, is there anyone here in person that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing no one here in person, we will transition to our remote audience. Seeing no one on our remote audience that would like to make a public comment, we will close the public comment period and I'll turn this over to the council. I say I have a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, uh, if there's a default on the bonds, who is responsible for taking care of the default? That property owner. Okay. And do we know what the current rating is on these bonds? Um, so, so these bonds, what were the rating of the old bonds? No, these, these bonds for community facilities, district bonds, they are not rated. They are not rated bonds. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have any comments? The motion, is there a motion to approve the uh, request? Well, right. I will make the motion then that the City Council approve and adopt resolution number 2021 next in order, authorizing the insurance of not to exceed seven million aggregated principal amount of the City of Rancho Mirage Community Facilities District Number 4B Del Webb project, special tax bond series 2021A, approving the executive and delivery of the indenture, a bond purchase agreement, a continuing disclosure agreement and the preparation of the official statement and other matters related there too. And I'll, I'll second, second that. that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christy, please take the vote. Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. We will now move on to agenda item number 15. Uh, which is two resolutions associated with the Del Webb Rancho Mirage uh, Community Facilities District Number 4C formation. And Kofi Antebaum, our Director of Administrative Services, will take this. Thank you, Mr. Hageman. Mayor and Council, um, as specified in the development agreement between the city and developer dated November 4, 2016, the developer requested for the city to form three community facilities district and issue bonded debt to assist in funding public improvement costs and public infrastructure fees for the six phases of the Del Webb project. The action before you today for consideration are two resolutions. One, an intent to establish CFD 4C um, and to authorize the levy of special taxes, and then B, incur bonded debt to fund public improvements that are specific to CFD 4C. The city received a petition from the developer requesting that the city move forward and declare its intent to form CFD number 4C and incur special tax debt. The bonds are not expected to be issued until the spring or summer of 2022. Similar to CFDs number 4A and 4B, these bonds are not the debt of the city and pledge, um, special tax revenues are pledged to pay for these bonds. The tax burden incur the tax burden, including CFD 4C taxes, are expected to be 1.70% of assessed valuation. Property owners are notified of the special tax prior to the purchase of the home, and they also have the option of prepayment of the special tax. Today's action, if approved, is the first step of the CFD formation process, and step two a notice public hearing is proposed to take place at the council meeting on May 6, 2021. There is no fiscal impact to the city as a result of this action. This concludes my presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Kofi. Uh, let's go ahead and open up the public comment period on this item. If any member of the public wishes to speak, speak on this item, now is the time to do so. If you are on Zoom, you would hit the raise hand button. If you're on your telephone, you would hit star nine. 
before uh, we go to our remote audience. Is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no one here in person, we will go to our remote audience. Seeing no one that wishes to speak, we'll close the public comment period and I'll return this to the council. Charlie, do you have a motion? Let, let me ask uh, Kofi, I assume that, uh, that these bonds, just like the previous uh, item, uh, are, uh, are unrated at the present time? Yes. Okay. No, I'm ready. Senator what? <laughs> no, no, I'm ready. Unrated? Unrated. <clears throat> you have a motion on that? Uh... Sure, I'll make the motion that the City Council approve and adopt the following resolution. A, resolution number 2021, next in order, intention to establish a community facilities district and to authorize the levy of special taxes. And B, resolution number 2021, next in order, incur bonded indebtedness to finance the acquisition and construction of certain public facilities in order to mitigate the impacts of development with the proposed city of Rancho Mirage Community Facilities District Number four, C. Del Webb project. That comes. Our city attorney isn't here. Uh, can, oh, or maybe I don't see him anyway. Uh, can we do A and B together, or do we here. have to separate them? I'm here. No, you can do them. You can do them together, as long as the vote's the same. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Christy, please take yes. the vote. Council Member Kite. Yes. Council Member Smartrich. Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. We will uh, now move on to item number 16 on our agenda, which is the uh, consideration of uh, a donation of $100,000 to the CV Housing First program. Uh, so I will give a, a very brief introduction and then uh, on the phone we have uh, Tom Kirk, the executive director of the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, uh, who will give us an overview of this program uh, and some of its uh, success. So uh, as Council Member Townsend well knows, as a member of the CVAG Homelessness Committee, um, you know, this is an issue that is impacting uh, us here locally and the state of California and really nationally. Um, and the entire city council um, attended the Barbara Poppy report. And essentially, um, before you can, um, you know, provide wraparound services, you have to solve the number one issue, which is uh, uh, homelessness. So they, they need a shelter before you can start to take care of any of the wraparound services. And so really that's what this uh, regional program does. The CV Housing First program is it first focuses on let's get them into housing and then we can start to help them with any additional wraparound services uh, that they need. Um, and some of the uh, information that we've seen in the past and that was highlighted in the Barbara Poppy report is uh, the, the different success rates between uh, providing uh, stable housing compared to the shelter model. Uh, so that's not to say that our local shelters uh, are not needed. Uh, they provide a, a great service to our community and the city financially supports them as well. Uh, but really when it comes to the issue of solving homelessness, uh, it's housing. And that's what this program does. So uh, without uh, uh, any more information from me, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Tom Kirk so that he can uh, give us all an update uh, on the program. Tom? Thank you, Isaiah and Mayor Hobart and Mayor Pro Tem Weil and the rest of the council. It's great to see everybody, even if it's virtually. And Isaiah did uh, what I'm gonna do in about 13 minutes. Isaiah summed it up in one minute, which I appreciate. And I'm going to introduce uh, Greg, Rod Greg Rodriguez, who most of you know, works with the County of Riverside and is our partner in this program, as well as Tom Cox, who works for me, and he'll be helping me out with the presentation. So um, after a long discussion about six star housing and resort housing, we're going to talk about the exact opposite end of the housing spectrum and those that don't have housing at all. 
With that, Good segue. thank you. Uh, with that, I will share my screen and we'll be off. I'm going to give you a little background, and maybe not so much for all of you, but for those that might be watching and listening of our homelessness program regionally, talk about our Housing First program, how it relates to the shelter system that Isaiah was just describing, and where we're headed next. Housing First. How did we get here? Well, you remember probably 12, 13 years ago, there was a lot of concern about services being concentrated in India. We had the shelters there, we had county services, and when there were homeless clients in Palm Springs or Cathedral City, they probably were being shipped essentially to India or Coachella to solve their problems. And Roy's was born. The county built the facility and CVAG ran it with Jewish Family Services of the Desert for nearly 10 years. And I'd like to remind people that we helped literally thousands of people at Roy's. But we had a little problem. It was a transportation problem. Most of you know where Roy's is or was. It's north of the freeway, was not on a bus line. And we spend about one third of our budget every year moving people back and forth from Roy's to Rancho Mirage or Cathedral City or Palm Springs or wherever. And in 2017, Jewish Family Services of the Desert said so long. They didn't want to operate the program anymore. And at the same time, the County of Riverside wanted to use the facility as a long-term mental health care facility. And that facility opened with 90 beds in August. So in 2017, we closed the door to Roy's and we opened the door to what was a new concept, certainly for me, and that's housing first. And Isaiah described it. Path of Life Ministries was hired, they, they're based in Riverside, and they operated the program until the end of last year. Isaiah also mentioned Barbara Poppy's report. You all, thank, thankfully, you all came and listened to her full report. And you remember, Housing First is taking the chronically homeless, those that might be new on the street, just got on the street because of bad luck or lost their job, or a family in need, and putting a roof over their house. I'm sorry, a roof over their head. And that sounds simple, but it's not sometimes. We don't ask questions. We get them housing immediately, and then we have wraparound services to work with them, whether it's looking for jobs, uh, alcohol counseling, mental health issues, helping them with their issues with the criminal justice system. And if you remember at Roy's, we did kind of the opposite. If we had a potential client who had major drug or alcohol problems, we said, we're not going to accept you. Or if you had mental health issues that were really evident, guess what? We didn't let you in through the door. Or if you had a violent past or a criminal record that suggested violence, of course we didn't let you in. We had a hundred other clients, some of whom were women, some with children, and we didn't want those with a criminal background inside Roy's. So guess what? We certainly let in families, and we let in those that were perhaps temporarily homeless, but the chronically homeless, the people that your constituents see on the streets, the people we all see on the streets, and this is a character, you know, this is what we think of the chronically homeless. Uh, they look, they come in all sorts of different colors, stripes, ages, but those are the people we see on the st streets every day. And frankly, if we ask them to come to a shelter, a lot of them say no. They don't want to mix with 100 other people. And yet it's the chronically homeless that are taking up time, energy, and guess what? Taxpayer dollars every day in our community. They're the ones that are, are, are in our emergency rooms. If they have a minor medical problem, they're not at a doctor, they're not at a clinic, they go to the emergency room. They are often the ones that are in front of or behind your commercial areas. And because of that, and this is your colleague just to the west, Mark Carnavali, that some of you know uh, is a regular member of our homeless committee and said, we need to address the chronically homeless. 
They are the ones that get your attention and for good reason. They're taking up a lot of time and energy by public services. And yet again, we weren't accepting them mostly at Roy's. So uh, kickstarting CB200, I mentioned Path of Life Ministries. We didn't continue the contract at the end of last year. And, it, and uh, when we did that, we actually decided to take our program in-house. And the biggest critic of doing so for years was a guy by the name of Tom Kirk. I did not want to hire staff and run a pro homeless program. I reluctantly agreed to do so. And I know we had reservations among a lot of our elected officials, but we hired a staff. And leading that staff, staff is Tom Cox. He's on the line with me now. He worked at Rescue Mission. And in the fall of last year, he went around to your sheriff, the Palm Springs City Police Department, and all of our public service providers and asked, all right, who are your chronically homeless? We wanted to develop a list of 100 people and focus on them, get them off the street and help. And by the time he started working on this, our list of 100 people morphed into a list of 200 people. 200 chronically homeless people, the people that are on the street for more than a year, probably have mental health issues, probably have drug issues or both, and we want to work on getting them off the street and into permanent housing. January of this year, we officially started our program, 200 people on our list, hired a staff of three others to help, Anise, Stephanie, and Ivan, all of whom had some background in, in this sort of work. And this could say result after 80 or 90 days. It's about the same. Our, our results after the first quarter will be presented to you, Mr. Townsend, at our homeless committee meeting in a couple of weeks. And they're gonna look very similar to this. We characterize our results really in two different ways. One is through rapid resolution. In other words, is there a way with a chronically homeless person to help them fix their car, pay their first and last month's rent, uh, contact a family member that they're estranged with? Is there an easy way to get them off the street? And mostly the answer is no. But of the 200 people on our list, three of them, we got off the street with a relatively easy fix. Tom Cox, can you describe this woman's story? Yeah, this is P. She was on our CV200 list. She was living in her car for three years until it was repossessed. P was unable to make the payments because she was on a fixed income. So we used our rapid resolution funding and we were able to get her car back, pay her deposit and first month's rent to her senior low income apartment. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the second way we get people off the street is in what, again, Isaiah described. We don't ask questions. We ask the chronically homeless person who's never probably wanted to go into a shelter and say, would you accept an apartment for 30 or 60 or 90 days? No questions asked. We'll allow you to bring your pets, your partners, and or your property. No questions asked, no conditions. And we've been able to take 16 people off of this list of 200 and taking them off the list and into permanent housing. Mr. Cox, this man's story. This is H. He was also on the CV200 list. He's a veteran and was homeless for 40 years. We used our crisis stabilization unit and we got his veteran paperwork together and finalized and H has moved into his senior in low income apartment. Uh, lastly, and we certainly don't like this kind of statistic, one person died as he's going through our program. And it just goes to show you that getting out to the homeless, the chronically homeless sooner rather than later, so we get to them and help them before this happens is really important. So total quote, successful exits already in the first quarter is 20. I think that's not a bad pace dealing with the most challenging part of our homeless program. That's where applause comes in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
And I want to relate uh, the same point as Ann made. Uh, it's not housing first or shelters, it's housing first and shelters. We know the shelter system does a great job of addressing short-term homelessness or the needs of families. But that chronically homeless person, they probably need a more intensive program, like a housing first program. And I've got to admit, we're not going to help very many people this year compared to the shelter system. Shelters will give you statistics about how many showers and meals and overnight stays. We've done that at Roy's. We're going to be focused on how many successful exits off the street. And it's going to be measured in the dozens, not the hundreds or thousands. Our budget is significant, but the shelter systems in the Coachella Valley have budgets that are four or five or six times larger than our annual budget. So I'm going to put our program into perspective. We can't do it all. And our cost per client is expensive. We put a single chronically homeless person into a, an apartment and we have wraparound services for 30, 60 or 90 days. That's much more expensive per client than running a shelter. But as a reminder to you and your taxpayer constituents, who is costing the most money to our system right now? It's the chronically homeless. They are the ones that your deputies have to address. And I say your, I know Ranch Mirage doesn't have a huge homelessness program problem, but you look valley wide, our deputies are spending a lot of time with homeless people. They're spending a lot, and our emergency rooms are spending a lot of time with the chronically homeless as well. And to, again, Isaiah's point earlier about successful rates. When we ran our program at Roy's, again, um, we would hear from Jewish Family Services about the hundreds of people we're helping, but there wasn't much focus on how many ended up off the streets. <clears throat> the Desert Sun ran an analysis and showed that in our shelter systems, all of them in the Coachella Valley, the success rate is about 5%. 5%. Housing First, under even the Path of Life program, was 65%. I'm hopeful that we're going to beat that this year. And I say that even though we're focused on the most challenging part of the homeless problem. So looking forward, uh, we've got a good, a good track record already. I'm hopeful that we'll have a great one over the course of the year. We will reevaluate this at the end of the year, decide how best to move forward. Every time we move somebody out of one of our temporary units, we move somebody in. You see the two empty little houses at the bottom. Sometimes life isn't perfect and somebody isn't on our Coachella Valley 200 list. Sometimes a mayor, whether it's you, Mayor Hobart or another, calls us up and says, we have somebody else that's chronically homeless and needs to be a part of this program. And we help them too. Tom Cox, can you share this gentleman's story? Last I heard he was in one of our units. Yes, this is, this is Ann on the CV200 list. Uh, I'd like to thank Deputy Nelson and Alex and Donna from the H Hope team from Palm Desert. Uh, M is in our unit. He's receiving intensive case management. Uh, he has a housing voucher. So now we're looking for a permanent home for M and he will soon move in. And this couple's story. This couple was homeless in Indio, uh, both of them unemployed. Now both of them are employed and we're looking for housing for them. Uh, Hopefully that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Tom. We also received a $250,000 grant essentially through the county. We're gonna take this beautiful shuttle and no, it's not a bad photo. It's just a pretty ugly shuttle. that's seen a lot of wear and tear when we ran it at Roy's and turn it into a mobile access center. We also have funding to have two more employees, at least for two years, help us with outreach and case management. 
That'll allow us to get really out into encampments and do street outreach. It makes no sense to have a homeless program where somebody's sitting in an office most of the time. We're also working with the Desert Healthcare District and focusing on those hospital frequent flyers. The hospitals can't give us the names of people for, because of privacy issues, but we can help them with discharge planning. And we believe there's a significant overlap between the people your deputies service and those that the hospitals are servicing. And we've worked with the Desert Healthcare District, and I'm proud to say about a week ago, they approved another $500,000 match to our program. Uh, as long as the cities continue their financial commitment and the county does, the healthcare district is in for another $500,000. And that will allow us to increase those rapid resolution uh, dollars, or at least have more of those, do the discharge planning, have respite care, et cetera. So next step, uh, we're gonna build on our early success. We're gonna continue to ask the cities and county to budget as you have your $100,000. This council has been a supporter all the way along of a regional approach to homelessness. Thank you so much. We're gonna implement that grant for the mobile access center. We're expanding and targeting the emergency room component of this, work with the hospitals. And as I should really update this, we have received the financial partnership with the healthcare district. Uh, with that, uh, Mayor and members of the council, I know a couple of you have seen this before. I apologize for that, but I'd be happy to address any questions and comments with Tom and Greg's help as well. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, that's some great information. I appreciate you guys sticking in. It's been a, a long meeting and uh, being here to answer questions for us and really, I think, uh, give us an overview of a very important program uh, within our region. Uh, before we go to the council with any comments or questions, let's go ahead and open up the public comment period on this item. So if there's any member of the public that wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you would hit the raise hand button or star nine on your telephone to make a comment on this item. Is there anyone here in person that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing no one here in person, we will go to our remote audience. Okay, um, seeing no one here uh, remotely either. Uh, I'll turn this over to the council to uh, ask any questions. Hey, Tom. Hey, Charlie. Hey, this is Charlie. Hey, Dana, go ahead. I, I just briefly, I just wanted to thank Tom for the uh, very clear and convincing uh, presentation of the issue. And uh, I'm sure Ranch Mirage will continue the path that it began a long time ago and others weren't doing the same. And uh, you can count on us. And uh, again, I thought your presentation was very good. Thank you, Mayor. And what you'll get from me every quarter, as long as we run this program, is a clear picture of what we're doing well and what we may not be doing well. We're going to have plenty of failures in this program, too. And we're going to be honest about that. Thank you. Um, what's hey, the cost uh, of the program? The cost of the program, right now we, we budgeted $700,000 initially. We'll obviously have the grant money coming in from the Mobile Access Center, uh, as well uh, as the, the Desert Healthcare District. And we'll obviously step up the overall budget once those funds are mat materialized. And how many cities contribute? Uh, uh, that is always an unknown. Uh, and this is part of the reason I'm giving this update. Uh, last year, I believe we had eight cities contribute, almost all of them at the $100,000 level. Uh, this year, I'm hopeful that we're gonna get every city contribute, maybe even $100,000. Okay. And we'll step up our, if we continue to be successful, that means more units and getting more of those people off the street sooner. That's the game plan. Good job. Very good. Hey, Tom, Charlie here. Uh, you know, the Ranch Prize, Dana said, when we opened Roy's, we contributed over a million dollars to the lifespan of that project. And uh, we are always there to try to help. And um, 
I know that being with you for I don't know how many years on this commission, that you were you were not wanting to take over this responsibility. You fought it. But I think in the long run, if you did try the other groups that we did, and I think putting your staff together at CVAG, you're going to have a, a better success of this program. But let me let me ask you uh, this kind of, I don't know if you want to answer this or not. Palm Springs was given, or the Coachella Valley, the $10 million from uh, the governor on uh, housing. And I know we have the commission that went up there and got it. And I know that we tried to buy the hotel in Palm Springs to do this. Do you want to give any kind of update of where we are with that as far as housing? Craig Rodriguez. <clears throat> yeah. Thank hey, you. Craig. Hey, Councilmember Townsend. Thank you for a great question. Um, sure. Um, as, as you do know, the governor announced the Project Home Key, uh, which was the extension of Project Room Key to acquire either uh, hotels or apartment buildings for rehabilitation for permanent supportive housing. The county did work in partnership with the city of Palm Springs, who uh, do, uh, allocated $3 million for that um, on top yeah. of the county's contribution that we got from the state. Um, and to put an offer on the Ivy Palm in Palm Springs, unfortunately, that property was in bankruptcy. And on November 7th, the bankruptcy judge decided not to go through with the sale. We had to expend those funds by the 30th of December. We did frantically look to see if there was another property, but anybody who's involved in real estate knows to close on an escrow for a hotel within uh, basically 45 days is almost impossible. We were afraid we'd have to send that money back to the state. Luckily, we did not. Um, we were able to purchase 107 manufactured homes for the eastern part of the valley um, as permanent units as well. The, uh, what the county did in order to hopefully, um, not hopefully, but to maintain uh, approximately the same number of permanent units in Palm Springs was worked with the city um, on some direct cash that we offered some land for three affordable housing projects that were approved by Palm Springs that will have permanent supportive units. We, um, the balance of the Palm Springs allocation, um, while it did specifically go to Palm Springs, uh, Assemblyman Mays and Garcia did want somewhat of a regional approach. As Tom Kirk said, we, you know, it's, homelessness doesn't end at city boundaries in this valley. Um, it is a, a collaborative uh, valley-wide uh, issue and we address it that way. Um, so we are looking, uh, uh, got some pretty good news a couple of days ago from the county that with some of the American Recovery Plan dollars that are targeted towards homelessness and housing, we're looking at a substantial capital allocation into the western part of the valley for a navigation center with element of permanent supportive housing as well. Very good. Greg, another question is, with this program, where are we trying to keep the emphasis on what is most important, the west or the east? And I know that's an issue. So I'll go back to that it's not either or. Um, what we're trying to do is take care and uh, handle homelessness throughout the valley. Um, that's what the, you know, as, as you're aware, Councilmember Townsend, the West Valley, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, um, originally when we uh, went away from Roy's and to the Housing First model, we were primarily just focused on the western part of the valley. As you're aware, though, over that six months to a year, we actually decided to extend that um, across the entire Coachella Valley, especially with the expansion of the healthcare district. And again, I get back to the fact that we have a very transient nature of homelessness. A lot of West Valley residents, homeless residents, are actually serviced um, at Martha's and CVRM. Um, so again, really, this is a holistic approach. That's a great thing about the mobile access center too. While there is a um, access, physical access center in the city of Palm Springs, the mobile access center is really going to allow um, Tom Cox and his team to expand. Uh, not that they are not already working there, but to have a much bigger uh, presence in throughout the valley. Very good. And I know that I know that uh, Iris has some questions right along those lines of the other the groups that are out there. So I'm going to defer to Iris. And Councilman Townsend, uh, yes. one story that I'm going to secretly tell you, and hopefully nobody else is listening. Nobody's going to know, Tom. Good. The secret is I just heard today that one of the homeless clients that's on our list that we chatted with in Palm Desert has a P.O. box in Indian Wells. So we're going to have to identify him as an Indian Wells homeless person. But don't ever say uh, that I said that publicly, okay? Unless you're angry. 
Hi, Rose. Well, thank, thank you, Charlie. I wanted to congratulate all three of you and your whole team. You're doing remarkable work and we appreciate everything you're doing. And we're just so fortunate that we have been able to contribute for all these years. But Tom or anyone, maybe you can give us an example of how you deal with somebody and improve the life, although we know it's not 100%, but someone who has been homeless for 40 years, where do you start? And you know how, how, how do you make their life much better other than housing? Tom Cox, yeah, I think you have an example of this, a recent one, don't you? Yeah, so we come along, we come alongside of them. Uh, sometimes it's just getting them used to normal basic functions like indoor plumbing, fixing a meal. And then as they progress, we come alongside of them and help them with different things like, uh, have you thought about increasing your income or benefit? Uh, here's how you take care of yourself. Here's how you initiate the self-care. And as we do that, we see the change happen where they have dignity. And, uh, that, you know, it, it's a process where some get it and some don't. Uh, but, the, you know, we're working with a lot of people that have poor health, no income, severe mental illness, substance misuse, and, you know, a lot of physical disability too, or they have all of the above. So it's a very challenging job, but it's very rewarding. Oh, I'm sure it must be. And one of the things is that um, when you when you talk about somebody who has been homeless for 40 years, uh, is that somebody who, and I know a lot of homeless people are working, but are still homeless or living in their cars. So if somebody that has been homeless for a 40 year period, are they amenable to even think about going back to work? I, I think everybody starts at different places. Some want to work and they've just had some bad luck. Others don't want to work or they can't work. So, you know, we're trying to get them to the point where um, they can increase their income or benefit. But, you know, oftentimes they haven't been to the doctor for years. And whether that's for mental health assistance or a checkup or physical, so sometimes we're just starting at a point where once they start feeling better uh, physically and also better about themselves, then, you know, we open up some new possibilities for them. And, uh, you know, I'd like to say that I can see someone and say, oh, this person's going to make it, and they don't. But they often surprise me as, you know, all of us do as people. You know, we, can, we can definitely uh, uh, address the struggles in our life if we have a little assistance. Thank you. That gives a lot of insight, I think, to all of our viewers also. Thank you. Tom, thanks very much. Um, I've heard the presentation, I guess, at least twice. I think I'm ready to uh, handle it a little bit. Uh, both Tom and Greg, thank you loads. Um, I want to tell you that um, Mayor Hernandez has some concern about your closing abilities uh, because he called and wanted to make sure that Rancho Mirage was on board regarding this hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and uh, I assured him uh, that yes we're fully committed as we have been in the past um, and uh, but I felt that maybe he didn't know if you were capable of asking for the order. <laughs> I assured him that you were, and, uh, and that's from first-hand experience. And speaking of first-hand experience, I talked to a homeless person about six months ago. He had struck up a conversation with me sitting outside, and he made a very intelligent comment, and he said, you know, I didn't plan to fail, but I failed to plan. Oh. And this from a, you know, from a homeless person living out of his car, um, very intelligent. So as Tom Cox, Greg, I know your story and I know your background. Um, it can happen to anybody and it can happen to anybody at any time. So. What you're doing is great, and uh, as you know, from the standpoint of Rancho Mirage, uh, we're fully aboard and fully committed. 
Mayor Pro Tem Weil, those are thoughtful words uh, from you and from the homeless person that you ran into. And it reminds us that each one of them is an individual. And with respect to Mayor Hernandez being concerned whether I could close, I think your city manager was also concerned. He said, Tom, are you sure you wanna show up at one of our city council meetings? This council is supportive of homelessness and financially contributing you're only gonna ruin things if you show up. So uh, um, Isaiah, we took a chance and I'm glad we did. Uh, this conversation's been very productive. Yeah, thanks for very being here. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for coming out today, I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom, good and presentation. It, it's it's good, good seeing all of you, hope, hope all goes well. Yeah, and Tommy, you're not shy. <laughs> Believe me, you're not shy. Some, Here, do we need a uh, do we need a motion? Yes. Yes, we do. And if I may, as the committee representative, I would like to make that motion on behalf of Rancho Mirage that the city right council ahead. that the city council approve and authorize a hundred thousand dollar funding request from the Coachella Valley Association of Government for the CV Housing First program. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Christy, please take the vote. Council Member Kite. Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes, Council absolutely. Member, Council Member Townsend? Yes. Sure. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. All right. So now you can go back home and feel that you've uh, accomplished everything you needed to. <laughs> there you go, Tom. Thank we, you, guys. We, we all are. Great we job. All, we're doing it together. Thank you. Thank you Thank guys you. for hanging in during a long meeting. Appreciate it. Okay, we will now move on to the last item on our agenda, item number 17. Uh, this is our COVID-19 update and Gabe Cotting, our Director of Marketing will be handling this item. Thank you, Mr. Hagerman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council and staff. And so he we're here today with the uh, COVID-19 uh, staff report update. Uh, we have a specific recommendation and requests. We are, like we do at the beginning of each month, we um, look to extend, have you extend the order uh, that the city manager has given out for the face coverings that lines it up with uh, the state's um, public health uh, face covering order. So you'll see that in your packet here today and just a couple updates. Um, this would extend it through our May 6th meeting. Uh, so this would extend it into May for another 30 days, 30 plus days. Uh, our COVID testing, we've extended through the end of May as demand shows. We've seen a little uptick in demand. So to date through today, uh, we've done almost uh, right around 300, uh, I'm sorry, 35,000, almost 800 tests. Uh, we've seen overall, overall with all those tests, we've done about uh, there's an average of about a 15% positivity rate, but we're seeing over the last five or the last two weeks, the positivity rate's been about 5%. And then we're uh, averaging about 180 tests a day over the last week or two weeks. And then we did switch our hours slightly, which we put online, we've put on social media, we've put on the signage. Uh, instead of Tuesday through Saturday, we're now going to be Monday through Friday. And then with the heat coming a little bit, more in the afternoons, we have adjusted the hours from eight to three. So we have been communicating that. That started today, um, actually, and it works because we have a shred event coming up on the 10th on a Saturday, so that we don't have to shut it down for that. And then our Great Plates program uh, is uh, currently in place till April 7th. We have not heard if that gets extended yet or not, but stats through today put us at uh, almost 280,000 meals delivered to, uh, to doors. We have about 371 participants, and right now that's about 6.1, 6 a little over 6.1 million delivered to local restaurants through this program. And uh, we continue to work with FEMA on complete reimbursement of that. So that concludes my, uh, my presentation. Again, we're just asking for uh, the approval and the extension of the, uh, of the face covering order and then take any action deemed necessary. I have a question if I uh, can. Um, of was a hundred and if I took it down right, 180 uh, people appeared for the uh, which event uh, for testing 
Yeah, that's our average per day over the last two weeks. Is okay. Um, now that doesn't. Uh, that, let me. I want to make my point before I lose track of it. That doesn't include getting a shot. That's different. Yeah, than, this is just the testing. This is the this is the no cost COVID testing, not vaccine. Okay, of, of the 186 that uh, were tested, um, were any of them? Uh, indicating a, a willingness, a desire even to uh, get the shots? Uh, if Or did you, maybe you didn't get anybody who tested positive, I don't know. But if you got somebody tested positive, would you be uh, in a position to give them a shot right then and there while, no. while they're in the mood? Yeah, no, no, because we're not a vaccine site. Uh, it was just announced that Eisenhower is going to actually be a public uh, vaccination um, site, and they just they've just started. So where you can book appointments per um, you know per the uh, the guidelines. So right now the recommendation is if you have it, you're supposed to wait a couple months before you actually get the shot. So those. Mm -hmm those uh, recommendations haven't changed. And today was the first day that the vaccine um, requirements and el eligibility <clears throat> dropped to age 50 and below. And then within two weeks time, it'll drop to 16 and, uh, and below. So county sites right. now, now with Eisenhower uh, becoming a public site and then more readily available through the Blue Shield partnership with the state of California. Uh, I think the vaccines will continue to, uh, to be rolled out in fashion in the in the county's been announcing all these past couple of weeks that they've had um extra appointments but yeah. now that it's dropped to age 50 you're going to see a surge in people going to get those and the appointments will be yeah. a little bit harder for the next couple of weeks let's hope so um, but, but to answer your question we don't we don't query people at the testing site curative right now like whether they want a vaccine or willing to get it Seems Gabe, like, uh, Gabe, I have a question. Yes, sir. Do we do we anticipate the color that we are now in the county to change over the near term? So that's a great question. So we're we're anticipating the orange tier. So the most recent commentary coming from the county public health is we've got there's a couple different scenarios, but right now our case rate and our adjusted case rate, like the we're everything's looking very positive for us to be trending down. We just need to be another week. So the first, this week's uh, indications were positive uh, in moving towards the orange, but we need to be in, in those, those numbers need to come out again next week for us to be considered um, the orange tier. So every, everything we're say, hearing from the county, we're still a couple weeks away from moving into the orange tier, but, but it's trending positively. Right, glad to hear that. Hey, Gabe, what does that mean, the orange tier? Why don't you elaborate on what it means? So that so the orange tier is, is the is the next level down. So I don't have the specifics in front of me, but obviously that allows more businesses, a little bit more capacity. Um, so it just it just it takes some of the restrictions that are in the red and the purple tier and makes them less restrictive. So I don't have the list of what the orange tier uh um, has it's on our website and anywhere you uh, you go you can kind of find out the details to it but it is the you know it is kind of the middle tier and, and is less restrictive than the one we're in right now so it'll be good news for our you know for the county certainly for our destination in our city for our hotels our businesses and 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 the like very good thank you Do we have any other information on this issue, or is that it? Uh, that's it, but let's go ahead and do public comment. Uh, so if any member of the public wishes to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. Um, if you're participating remotely, you would hit the raise hand button on Zoom. If you're on the telephone, you would hit star nine. Uh, is there anyone here in person that wishes to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no one here in person. And seeing no one on the remote audience either, we will close the public comment period on this item. And the only action uh, that we're seeking from the council is uh, action A, which is the extension of the face cover order. So moved. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christy, will you please take the vote? Councilmember Kite? Yes. Councilmember Smotrich? Yes. 
Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. We will now have our city attorney summarize the closed session agenda. Hello, I'm back. Hi, Steve. He's well, back. You know, based on that comment about our coot shooting ordinance, I would recommend that the mayor not go golfing until it takes. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor hasn't, go the mayor hasn't golfed for two years. <laughs> Stay off the golf course for a while, please. That was, that was funny. <laughs> the city council now is going to uh, recess into closed session. Uh, regarding two existing litigation items. That's going to be pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1 and involves these following cases. Vacation rental owners and neighbors of Rancho Mirage, Rancho Mirage Vacation Rentals LLC versus City of Rancho Mirage and Save Rancho Mirage versus City of Rancho Mirage. Those are the only two cases we're going to discuss in closed session. So see you in closed session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, how do we get? Do we come do back we and press a minutes? button or just leave it alone or what? So um, the council will leave this meeting and go to the closed session meeting. Any member of the public uh, can stay on this meeting, and uh, any reportable actions will be uh, announced after closed session. Do I hit leave meeting or just keep my fingers away from the screen? Uh, you, I need to know. You, you will leave the meeting. I will. We leave the meeting, and right? You leave the meeting, yes. So the council will now recess in the closed session. And then we get back. Jason will help you guys. All right, it is uh, now 648 and the city council took no reportable action in closed session. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>